Good evening, friends. Good afternoon, Heather. I'm happy to be here this afternoon. And, and if there's any good thing, let it be for the glory of God. If Mr. Jackson is in here from South Africa, Brother Jackson, if he's in the, the meeting this afternoon, Billy wants to see you at the book concession right away, Brother Jackson, about arrangements for tonight on leaving, if you will. He told me to announce that he wanted to meet you at the book stand right now. All right. And Billy, wherever you are, why, Brother Jackson will go to the book stand right away. Now to the, the audience, I wish to address you this afternoon in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As God has given me this privilege, along with you, to be his representative, his servant, and his child by grace through Jesus Christ. Many of us have many things that we would, could tell if each one could get up here and tell a life story. Many of it probably would be full of victory and power. Many of it would be full of heartaches and disappointments. And we each want to have a life that God has given us, and we must live it. And I, to my humble opinion, if you'll get this, I think the most best life in the world, no matter whether it's up or down, if we'll find God's path and walk in it, where God has ordained for us to walk. If we always, we find victory, no matter, I think of blind Fanny Crosby when she's sitting there in the darkness. The question is once asked, what think ye of Christ, whose son is he? And I think of all the man and great man down to the ages, any man that ever mounted to anything mostly, were men and women who believed Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? And I think of how the prophets wrote of him and how the, the ancient man, uh, they foretold of him and how the patriarchs and how the, the rulers who raised against him was brought low and so forth. And I think down to the age, I think of the father of our nation, uh, George Washington, how he trusted God. I think of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln, of course, uh, though not a politician. But Lincoln was my favorite amongst all the presidents we've ever had. He had to come up the hard way. Maybe because I had to come that way is the reason I sympathize with Lincoln. Splitting rails and writing in the dirt and, and so forth. And the only books that we believe that Lincoln ever had until he was 21 years old was the Bible and the Fox Book of Martyrs. That's what molded that character. Let me see what you read. Let me go in your office, in your house, and see what you read. I'll about to tell you what you are. That's right. See, everything to its nature. And you keep the Bible laying close for your children. Read it yourself. Be an example. That's what I didn't have in my younger life. But by God's grace, I want to put that before my children. And if there is another generation, may they put it before theirs. And now, if we could think today, I heard you want to come in last night, and my heart was thrilled when you were singing, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. This late Dr. DeWitt, when he was dying, he was standing before his congregation, he was trying to represent Jesus Christ as being the greatest of all. He was God, he was Emmanuel, and how his power should be in the church and would make them quit their selfishness. He's a pastor of a great church. And his congregation even was against him. They were waiting his for conference so they can vote him out and so forth and send him away. But his heart was a bleeding. And so then while he was preaching his heart out one day, he had a heart attack and fell forward. There had to be a physician in the church come to him and said, Dr. DeWitt, you just have a few minutes longer to live. You can't make it. He called for two faithful deacons who held up his hands, and he got his hands up and stared into his feet. He said, let me stand on my feet as long as there's breath in my body. Behind him was a cross that represented the cross, the cross of Christ was back there by his bad street. And he stood up like that. He said, if I have one word I want to say is this, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate all, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. He started staggering back.
backwards like that. When he went backwards, he threw one arm around one side of the cross and one the other and threw his head down and went to meet the Lord. Hallelujah. That's the way to go. I think of Paul Rader, that great gallant hero who stormed Chicago about the last revival you've ever had in Chicago. When Paul Rader stood there, went out there, and he was just among his own people and put him to grief and sorrow and upset, which gave him a cancer, and after a while died. Was the people that was against him and doing so was the ones who done it. When he was the uh, little Moody Bible Institute over here had their little quartet as understand out there singing for him. They had the window shades pulled down, and he was dying. And Paul was quite a, a cut-up. That's the last part of mine of Brother Bosworth. He's always had a little sense of humor. And so he looked around, he seen the curtains all down, he'd come to himself, look around, and said, Say, who's dying here, me or you? He said, Raise them shades and sing you some good gospel songs, savvy. And they got to singing, Down at the cross where my Savior died, or something like that. So that sounds better. So where's Luke? And Luke was back in another room. They brought Luke into where he was. He took hold of his hand and said, Luke, we've come a long ways together, brother. Down through the shady lane. But to think of it, in five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. God, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime with parties leave behind us, footprints on the sands of time. Markers for others to travel. Think of Lincoln when he was shot there because of his gallantry and standing for humane and what was right and for God. Told oh, when he was going to die, when the, the bullet that went through his glory uh, in his body there and his smothering to death, he said, Turn my head towards the setting of the sun. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done repeating the model prayer as he went out to meet God. Oh, my. What are we? Men and women, look at Eddie Pruitt there. He was a persecuted and everything, and what he thought. He wrote the, the one day there when the inspiration hit, and he picked up the pen and wrote the inauguration song, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. I think of Hudson there when he wrote uh, of the amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I think of blind Fanny Crosby. What could God promise you? You never seen daylight in your life. You were blind all your life. What do you think about Jesus Christ? She said, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others are calling, do not pass me by. Thou the stream of all my comfort more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee or whom in heaven but thee? Let us be up and doing with a heart for any time. Be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero. Each one of you is a Christian. If you're a born-again Christian, then let's stand up. No matter how bad the background has been, let's look forward now to the coming of our Lord, when this mortal will take on immortality. Back to a few moments now. I'm trying not to keep you no longer. Already, I'm past time. 20 minutes to after 3. I'm going for an hour. I'll try to be finished if I can. How many of you here probably have heard the life story? Things that I hate to go back over, but I, one of my greatest altar calls I ever made in America, I had 2,000 sinners to come to Jesus Christ in Pensacola, Florida. At the life story one afternoon, I trust to God, that was next to the Durban, where we had 30,000. Now, I want to read a portion of Scripture, always God's Word, because my Word fails, but God's Word can't fail. Now, I found in the 13th chapter of Hebrews, at beginning with the 10th verse and reading 14th verse inclusive, we have an altar whereof they who have no right which serve table, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burnt without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. How many of you is away from home today? Let's see your hand. Away from home. My, just look at here. As I think, 
By the time we'd sing that song, we're pilgrims and we're strangers here. We're seeking a city to come. Is that right? No matter where you ever roam, there'll be no place who will ever take home place. Is that right? Wouldn't you just like to take a little trip today, most all of you here are my age or maybe a little above? And um, wouldn't you just like to go back to childhood, just spin a little wheel and go back and live another day in childhood? Wouldn't you love to do that? Oh, how I would like to. Even though with its sorrows and tears and disappointments, I'd like to live one more day of it, just to go back. I remember the little old place where I come from, and no matter how humble it was, Every one of you here can remember the old place where mother used to stand under the tree, perhaps on an old cedar wash tub with a washboard, and you as a little girl or boy playing around. Many times you remember that, the many heartaches and sorrows that went through, how you pulled onto an old spotted apron. Like to see her again today, but that can't be now. No. She's gone on. I like to see old dad when I used to see him come from the sea with that red handkerchief sticking in his pocket. See him get up in the morning on a cold morning, go back and make a fire in a big old drum stove. I used to hear him saying, oh, where is my boy tonight? My heart overflows for a loving he knows, oh, where is my boy tonight? I have seen him stand by the little old wash bench with his sleeves rolled up washing his face and hands, and he had real black, wavy hair. He look around, oh, how I would like to see him once more, but I can't. He's gone on. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. If you could go back to the home where you was raised at, it wouldn't be the home that you was one time. Yeah, a few days ago, I was taking someone who came to visit me up to where the old home place was. Why, wow, there's a housing project. Well, it, it isn't the old home anymore. We have no continuing city. I remember when our first little old home we lived in was a log house. There was about three or four of us little Branhams out there. We didn't even have the floor, just, just the dirt. Pop it in the, right in the middle of the floor. He had a, a, a stump that had been sawed off and laid in there. Some rock laid on top of it and an old drum stove sitting there. And how the the table, what it was made out of, and an old bench that he got some boards off of a barn down there and installed a bench out like a church pew, like, and set it behind the table, and Mama had a little old, what we call, monkey stove. Anybody know what a monkey stove is this year? Oh, my, that's fine. An old-fashioned coal oil lamp. Did you ever clean the lamp chimney? Let's see. Well, Je I'm not the only country boy here. I'm going to take off my coat and feel right at home. That's right. Yes, sir. How many of you ever step on a straw pick? Let's see your hand. Well, say, Chicago's not a big place after all, is <laughs> That's right. Mama, how many times have I slept on an old straw pick? And the first time you put it in there, maybe feel the grasshopper kick and have to get up and find him, you know, when he's down there. Why, how many times I've done that? Sure. See, Mama, take that big old stick you had hanging on the wall, a piece of an old... Well, she don't used to she'd use it to poke her clothes without in the in the yard when she's boiling her clothes. Did you ever boil your clothes? And I got it. Oh my live soap, you know, and she'd use that to punch her clothes when she had a string in it. She'd hang it up on the wall. Now that was hers on that side, but the other side was the was the golden rule hung on the other right over the door. You see? It was a hickory about that long with all ten commandments rolled out on the end of it. Little boy, his must be eight, and dad believed in the golden rule in that way. So then, if that ever come up missing, there's a razor strop hanging back in the back there. That took its place. And I tell you, my education was pretty stiff. I, um, dad, I heard that Irish eyes flash like Stonewall Jackson. I know something's in for me when I done wrong, but I love him today with all my heart. He never gave me half the whippings that I deserve. And then I remember Mama used to take that stick and smooth out the, the, the bed, you know, the mash it down, you know, and smooth it out. How many know what a bolster is? The big, well, what do you know? Say, is there anybody here from Kentucky? Raise up your hands. Well, Mama, <laughs> that's really something, 
is it? <laughs> All right. Down in Indiana, or this is Indiana, down in southern Indiana, it's some, I asked there one day in my church, I said, how many here from Kentucky? And about two-thirds of them stood up. Someone said, I said, I don't get it. And one said, said Brother Brennan said, the groundhogs in Kentucky is tough the country. <laughs> so, <laughs> coming across from uh, over the other side. But there in the front is the little log cabin. I remember I used to look at them old chink mud in the cracks like that. I'd say, my, that house will stand forever. Why can't go down? What a wonderful place it is. But my, you should see it now. Here we have no continuing city. And around in front of the door was a place wore off or just bare and slick where we little bunch of brandoms played out there like a bunch of little possums or something. Around there, little bitty fellows walking around over one another. Say, I'd, I'd like to live that over again. I, I really would. I, I say, I remember the old spring where you used to go down there and lay down on my stomach and drink and drink. Come back up, blot and take that up jug of water out of the spring, back out to the field where he was in harvest or something. Worked so hard, so I see my mama cut his shirt loose from his back, from sunburn, or stick to his back, 75 cents a day, to take care of me. Look, it's true, you've read my life story out there. My dad did drink, but I don't care what he done, he's still my daddy. And let me tell you something, young folks, this afternoon. Don't you never get little enough to call your mother and dad the old man and woman. You don't never do that. No matter what they are, no matter what they are, you respect them as your dad and mother. You'll never know what, how you love them until you hear the cat squeaking of a casket going out and knowing that's the last of it. It won't be the old man or old woman then. A lot of times they're right when you think they're wrong. Always honor thy father and mother, which may lengthen the days upon the earth. The Lord thy God giveth thee. That's the first commandment with promise. Be kind to your mother and dad. I remember my daddy died. He's just beginning to gray a little bit at the temple. When he lay there in the casket, and I picked up his head, which had died right on my arm. I picked up his head, and his locks of hair fall down. I thought, oh, dad, I looked at his hand. He'd had his finger cut off there in a shredder one day. I thought of all the heartaches that I'd caused him. It wasn't the old man, that was my daddy. I don't care who else, what they thought about him, he was still my dad. I loved him and I love him today. I had the privilege of leading him to Christ. Now, my mother also, my mother's a living, she's supposed to arrive here this afternoon. And I trust that she will get here. Now, back in those days, I remember some of the little things just for details. I remember one thing that I stood in them days was every Saturday night, go to town to get the groceries. You ever had to do that? Go to a Saturday night and get the food for the week? We lived in the country, and I'd work hard all week. I got a dime when I was a great big boy, 12, 14 years old. I got 10 cents. Dad said, don't spend it all in one place. <laughs> 10 cents. Billy says, Daddy, you got five dollars you let me have. How things have changed. <laughs> Certainly have. I remember that 10 cents. I'd go to town and my going to this store and I get my my dime changed. And I get a penny's worth of red hot, about that many in the sack. <laughs> they wouldn't even let you look at them all they were a penny now. <laughs> then I go over and get a penny ice cream cone, a little bit of ice cream cone, you get it for a penny. What a day that was. <clears throat> but now it's different. Then when we were little bitty lads, I remember when we was all at home, you know, playing around the house. I used to see Dad come home, and on Saturday evening, we'd all, or afternoon, he'd get a little buckboard of a fair jersey wagon. We had a little old mule. We'd hook to that wagon, and this winter time, we'd put a straw in the back of the, of the wagon, little covered over wagon, and we'd get blankets and wrap up, and Dad and Mother set the front seat, and down the road they would go, and Mother and Dad talking, you know, this is about 25 years old apiece, I guess, and they were sitting up there talking, you know, driving this little old mule, or we was in first class. <laughs> Wasn't our mule or wagon, but we were going somewhere <laughs> to the store. 
Dad'd get about three dollars a half for the week, and he'd go down there to spend every bit of it nearly for groceries to feed all those kiddies through the week. We didn't have fried chicken and so forth, but we did have good things that really stuck to the ribs and potatoes and things like that that really hung on, went a long ways. And so I remember when Papa paid his grocery bill on Saturday night, that was a treat for the little Branham. You get a sack full of candy, little old peppermint stick candy. Say, you know, that that was good. I remember when he'd come out there, maybe you'd have, maybe there'd be four good-sized sticks and they were five brands to divide it between. Everyone looking to see if he got in here. <laughs> them sticks had to be broken up and d- divided just exactly the equal among them because all eyes were turned on that candy. I guess I cheated a little bit on it. All the kiddies would get all they could eat, you know, and they would just eat and all they couldn't eat their candy up. I licked my little while, you know, and I'd reach over and get a piece of that old brown paper sack the meal was wrapped in and pull it off a little piece of it and roll it up and put it in my pocket. I wait till Monday. And so then I think now Monday come along and Mom would say, Billy? I say, Yes, ma'am. Uh, take the bucket. It wasn't one of these little old galvanized buckets, it was a big cedar bucket. An old gourd dipper. How many ever seen a gourd dipper? Oh, that's right. All right. And go down to the spring and pull up the water, you know, and put it into the bucket. My, that was a job. I look over to my brother. I said, tell you what to do. If you go get that bucket of water, I'll take, I've got my candy yet. I'll let you lick it till I count ten slow. One, two, like that. <laughs> I was a businessman. <laughs> Sat back in the shade, you know, while my brother went and got the water to lick on the candy. Well, I tried to make that tin just about as good as I could during your theme lick. <laughs> you got more than tin licks off of it, all right. Well, money would be a pretty good day for me because I keep that piece of candy, you know, just work right on that candy. And they know what I had it, too, you know, so I, oh my. I guess today I could go out and not on Sunday, but some other day, and buy a box of Hershey's, but it never tastes like that candy. How many of you eat peppermint candy and old-fashioned barrel crackers? Let's see your hands. Oh, my. Say, I'm telling you, that wouldn't go bad right now. That's right. And, you know, for a meal, we'd have mulligan stew with Irish to the core, you know. And how many know what mulligan stew is? Say, that's when you boil everything in the kitchen, even to the dish rag almost. Just put everything in a pot and boil it. That's right. Get everything in there, boil it up, the turnips, the, the carrots, and the potatoes, and the beans, and the meal, and just put it all together and boil it. Well, almost that mulligan stood that last two or three days we had on Sunday. Had beef in it, you know, so it had to be good. Quarters worth of beef? My, it chunk that big. So then it, it, Mama dice it up. What's the mind of Buddy Robinson when he said he, one time, Uncle Buddy said, I tell you, that I went out west and they was having a depression out there and said a great drought was on, had nothing to eat. The only thing we had was dried apples that I eat them for breakfast, drink them water for dinner, swell them up in time for supper. So that's not the way that mulligan stew lasted. Just constantly all, so that Wednesday it played out. And then we went back to something else. Great day, oh my. I remember how the, Back in those days, going to school, I remember Brother Nan, the one next to me, he's in glory too, and how we went to school together, and we'd go to school, and we were about the poorest kids there was. We'd come across the river from Kentucky, and the Indiana people are just a little more wealth than they are down in the mountain part of Kentucky anyhow, where I was born at, and, and I've been the only Kentuckian among them, I sure had a hard way to go, I mean I did. They just teased me all the time about being a corn cracker. And so I talked real funny, you know. <laughs> I, or even, I didn't talk clean, maybe not yet, but uh, a little better job out of it. So I was kind of tongue-tied like, you know, and I'd talk funny and they'd laugh at me and oh, I had an awful time. And ragged, oh my. And I remember there's one thing about my dad. He would, now if he owed a grocery bill, he'd go pay that bill. But if he had 10 cents left over, he'd drink it. Everything he had, he'd drink up. And that's the reason today I'm so firmly against drinking. The reason I'm so firmly against that stuff because I knew it ruined my home and spoiled me for 
from a love that I always wanted to be loved, that somebody to love me, and even my people in that way while I was, I, I just didn't have it. And we went to school half naked, and what a horrible life we had, all because of drink. My daddy was a, was a real man if he just hadn't had that habit of drinking. And I know that it's one of the curses of a nation, and I'm against the thing. You say, well, a little beer hurts you. You just get born again and go ahead and drink all the beer you want to after you get born again. That's right. You can just drink all you want after you get born again. But you get born again first. And uh, that, that's all you have to do. So then uh, I remember in school one day when I seen reading in my history, I was looking there and no one is sitting there in kitties laughing at me. Been so ragged, my hair hanging down my neck, and they'd laugh at me, and I was reading the book where Abraham Lincoln got off of a boat down in New Orleans, and he was, he, he seen a colored man been auctioned off, he said, that's wrong. He said, that's wrong. And someday I'll hit that if it takes my life, I'll hit it. And he did, and he took his life, exactly. And I screwed in my geography book, not mine, but when I borrowed it, I didn't have any of my own. I pushed it back and I said, and drinking is wrong and someday I'll hit it if it takes my life. Against it. Yes, sir. And I say this in regards right now, that any person that's really had a touch of Jesus Christ is finished with drinking. That's right. I got my first Bible. People used to say, is it wrong to do this, wrong to smoke, wrong to drink? I put a little, a little slogan in the back of my Bible. I picked it up here a few days ago. I was looking at a little bitty old Bible. I said, don't ask me foolish questions. Just make this up in your mind. If you love the Lord with all your heart, you don't smoke, you drink, and he shine. And that's right. That still hangs good, and that's been 20 years ago since I wrote it in there. A man that's born again has no use for this stuff. Now, look what it's hatched out here in America. You can see whether there's any harm to it or not. One time we had probation, of course, we had gang wars and things, but what did they do? Just like pulling around with the egg. Go to fool with the middle of it, you have the whole thing everywhere. And I'm not, I say I'm not a politician or nothing, it's none of my business what they do, that's their business, mine's to preach the gospel. But here's one thing, brother, that when, just as we went back and put whiskey in all these places, we took the prostitute off of the roll and the drunken gambling places and stuck it right in our refrigerator. I've seen a picture one time of old John Barleycorn, they call him the whiskey man. He had his hat set on the back of his head and he wasn't a horrible looking scarecrow. They painted him up now, they put him in bumpers, but he's still old John Barleycorn, the same old fella. That's exactly right. It's like trying to paint a hog up and wash him up and try to make a good, different creature out of him. He'll go to the water just as hard as he can go till he get his nature changed. The thing is, man and women's got to do now is get their nature changed. God changes a man's makeup, changes his nature, makes him a new creature in Christ. I know you believe that. Now, but I never come here to preach, oh, I, I, to tell you my life story. But just to think of how that those days, how that was, I remember studying in school. I went to school one complete year without a shirt on. I didn't even have a shirt in my name. Ms. Wappen, a rich woman, she's in glory today, a Catholic woman, yet if, oh, I know she was a Christian. And she gave me a coat, and I wore that coat. I, did, I had on a, an old pair of tennis shoes, and my feet was, uh, the tops of them was out, and my toes stuck up like turtle heads out of the pond. Wanted to see my feet sticking up that snow coming down, coming to school. I sat there in this big old coat on it come spring of the year, and I remember one day, awful warm and the perspiration just running down my face. I thought, my eyes hot. Mrs. Temple, she might be sitting present for all I know. She doesn't live too far from here. If she is, God bless you, Mother Temple. She's been a lot to my life. All right. What I'm going to say, or I call, maybe see if she's here. If you are, uh, I still love you, sister. She said, William, I had my coat collar buttoned up like this. She said, William, aren't you hot with that coat on? The kitties begin to say, you know, and it didn't smell so very good, I suppose. Weren't it all winter? Said, uh, aren't, aren't you hot with that coat on? I said, no, ma'am, I'm, I'm a little bit cold. <laughs> cold. 
I couldn't take that coat off. I didn't have no shirt on. So she said, uh, well, Sonny, you must be taking a cold, William. She said, you better come over to the stove. So she built up the fire. <laughs> Set me down there, and I sat there, and the perspiration is pouring off of me. She said, aren't, uh, aren't you warm enough to take that coat off yet, William? I said, no, ma'am, it's simple. I'm still cold. <laughs> I couldn't take it off, I didn't have no shirt on. So she said, uh, well, I believe you're sick. I better send you home. <laughs> and she sent me home thinking that I was sick in the cold, but I just didn't have on any shirt. I couldn't take it off. Now I went to school with Mama's shoe on one side and Papa's on the other one. That's exactly right. A boot and gagger, if you know what I'm talking about. Like that. And what a great big boy, just because of Satan and sin and when we were eating, I remember we couldn't eat with the rest of the kiddies. They'd all have sandwiches, the light bread. You remember when you used to have the old loaf bread that you'd get it and save the, the tags off the back of it for certain things, safety razors and so forth? And I remember when they used to have that and the women the most baked their bread. We couldn't do that. We couldn't afford it. And they'd all take sandwiches and make little sandwiches. But brother and I couldn't do that. We had, this, we had a little half a gallon molasses bucket about like that and in there we had a little jar and it'd be full of greens the next one full of beans two pieces of cornbread and two spoons which slip off was a shame to eat before the other children who had cakes and cookies and things and we would go down next to the river and sit down there and set this out on the log and and, and sit there and eat both of us we'd i'd take a bite out of out of the little jar of beans and, and brother take a bite and then we'd take a bite out of the greens not too much we had to make it dip it up between us and two pieces of cornbread, whole cake cornbread that Mama had baked for breakfast. And cut the little slices like that, just had to go along with the rest of the kids. Oh, I remember one time around Christmas time, I hate to get into these things, but around Christmas time, um, we had a Christmas tree. And the kids down at school were taking, cut little white strips of paper and blue ones and green ones and made little chains, you know how they used to do in school. And we took ours home, so Mama thought she went back out in the field. We did and cut a little Christmas tree about like that. And Papa went out and he'd got some popcorn that they'd raised. And they, they popped the corn and made strings. And Mom strung it up with a, a needle and thread to put around the, the Christmas tree. Or we was going to have a Christmas tree. We'd hang up our stockings on Christmas night. And next morning, maybe have an orange and three pieces of candy laying out in a little piece of paper laying to one side, maybe little bitty pieces of candy, and if we had an orange and a piece of candy and an apple, oh, what a great fellow Santa Claus was to come bring that to us. How happy we was. My, we'd eat those oranges and dry the peeling and then eat the peeling. Many times I packed peeling in my pocket for week after week and eat those orange peelings. Now, we wasted nothing of it. Now, I remember very well one time when Mama popped some corn, she had a, um, another little uh, half a gallon syrup bucket, and she put that full of popcorn. And my brother that's in glory today, when we took it down and set it in the old cloakroom, country school, I got set back there and I thought, oh, what I would, that was a, what we call a rarity, you know, something very rare. I thought, wonder if I could just before dinner time get a good handful of that, see, before dinner time comes. So I, Figured it all up, so I raised up my hand, asked the teacher, may I be excused? Yes. And so we, I went out through the cloakroom, I opened up this bucket, reached down there, got a great big handful of that corn, put the bucket back, went around, or the bucket lid rather, went back and stood behind the old chimney back there and eat that popcorn. Oh, it was good. I come back in and wiped my mouth real good, my hands, you know, so my brother wouldn't notice it. And so when dinner time come, we went out, picked up our bucket, went out to eat. After we we won't eat the popcorn first, you know, because that was better than what we had. So we opened up the bucket, and about a third of it was gone. So my brother looked around, and he said, Say, he said, something's happened to that popcorn. I said, sure has. <laughs> I know what had happened. You know, friends, not long ago, I come up from Houston. I was having a meeting there. I've been so tired. I, I just couldn't. I, I just passed out. I stayed eight days and nights without leaving the platform. 
I said, I'll pray for everybody come. And I stayed there and praying in the line. So I was so unconscious, they packed me to the car. And I, they'd, I'd lay against the pulpit and sleep a little. And then I'd wake up. The prayer line's still waiting. I don't know where it was out there on the street. I just just keep on praying for one or the other. Then they'd bring me something out to eat a little bit. And then maybe it'd pray until it gets so sleepy, I'd lean against the pulpit like that. For hours after hours, I got into the ward. They tried to put me to bed, and I couldn't go to bed. Then I couldn't sleep. I started home. Now, I never will ever get on the road home. I, I was driving along, and I'd wake up. I had an old Ford that had been about five years ago, and it was backslid. And it was, uh, well, you know, <laughs> what I mean, it was, it was all right. It had just been treated pretty heavy. And so I didn't have any side in the thing where I beat my leg against it, trying to keep awake and pull all the hair so I don't have hair just on the back of my hand, trying to keep awake, praying for the sick, trying to keep awake to make my lines go on. I found somebody that loved me, and somebody who loved me, and I loved them, and I was trying to minister my heart out to them. And I remember waking up, I'd, and the cars would be blowing, I'd be asleep over on the other side of the road. And after a while, the funny part of it, I woke up, I stopped, I couldn't get to myself, and I, I had my hands out the window, and I was in a cow pasture. I had my hands out the window saying, only believe, sister, that's the only thing you have to do, just believe. And I, I said, what's the matter with me? I, I got out, done on off the road, out into a cow pasture, sleep on the road. And I come home, and oh my, when I got home, there they was, and before we kept the people from the house and there that was lined up there, 150, 200 of them sitting before the place. And wife, I'd prayed for as many as I possibly could. It's coming long towards daylight. I heard her, I believe these, these people might be here today. Was, uh, she got me to bed and I was getting quiet. And I'd wake up and after a while I'd have my arm around the pillow, standing out on the floor, saying, now and who's next? Now if you just believe, Jesus Christ said, if I get the people to believe, Free was my pillow in my arm. And my wife had sat down and cried. She's 32 years old, turned snow white almost. If there's any credit goes to the Brandon family, give it to my wife. She's the one who deserves it, not me. And standing there, I remember she, I just got to sleep. I heard a rattling of a noise, and it was an old Chevrolet. Drove all the way from up here to Ohio to come down. A little baby crying, hadn't ceased for days. The doctor didn't know what was the matter with it. And I heard the wife say, now, if you'll just sit down, as long about, about, I guess, around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, said, if you'll just sit down, said, I'll, I'll fix you something. He said, no, we've had breakfast, there, Sister Branham, but the only thing that we just thought about, we just got him to sleep, so don't wake him up right now. And I was laying in there, and I hear that little baby going, it's like, you know, wheeze and funny noise, crying until he just couldn't cry no more. You think I could sleep in that little thing laying in there and think maybe a prayer would help it? I couldn't do it. I staggered out into the room, and she started crying, went over and sat down. I said, Mother, do you believe? And she, we had two little rooms where we was living, and she laid the baby up there on the table, and I said, let's kneel around the table, and we started praying. While we were yet praying, the little baby quit crying. About an hour, and then they left. It was cooing and laughing. This mother went away is a little different. She said, before the crowds get gathered in, let me take you somewhere. So we got out in the car and went somewhere and up to Green's Mill where I seen the vision and where I was commissioned at. We came back down along the evening. We passed by this old schoolhouse where it used to stand. I stopped there. I remember the old well that I used to drink from. And the kiddies was little girl, my little Rebecca, was picking some violets. She was just about a year old or something, a year and a half. And she was picking some violets out there playing. And I went and drank from this old well. I thought as David said that he could just drink from that well. I went and leaned my arm over against the old wooden fence. I looked across there. I looked up across the field where he used to play. I remember out there how one day Dime of the first 1917 when a big snow come on the ground. There I remember all the boys with sleds out riding. They could ride. Brother and I didn't have no sled. 
I see the old hill where we used to coast down. I didn't have no sled. You know what we used for sled? We went out in the old country dump pile down there and got an old dish pan. And I sat down. We sat down in that dish pan, put our legs around one another to sleet on top of the ground. And many of you remember the 1917 snow. And I'd sit down in this dish pan. We'd put our arms around one another. Down the hill we go around and around and around in a dish pan. We wasn't as much class as the rest of them, but we were riding just the same. So what difference did it make? We're riding down the hill in this old dish pan, and after a while, the bottom come out of it. <laughs> I went and got me a log, Dan, and we got on a log, and I remember coming down just above the hill. We had a little log I'd chopped with an axe in front of it, and we'd get down through there, and there's a boy, as the time of the World War One. Everybody wore a uniform that was able to put on one, and a boyfriend of mine named Lloyd Ford, he used to sell these pathfinders, and so he, he got him a, a boy scout suit. And oh, how I longed for a boy scout suit. My, now I look at him in that boy scout suit, he'd wear it to school, and how I like that. I made an agreement with him. I said, Lloyd, when you wear that thing out, will you give it to me? He said, sure, I'll give it to you, Billy. I said, all right. Well, on and on it went, and after a while, he quit wearing it. I asked him about it. He said, I'll see what happened to it. Well, the thing had been destroyed. The only thing he could find was one leg, and so I asked him, bring me that. So he brought it to me, and I remember riding down the hill one day. I wanted to wear that leg so bad. I didn't know what to do. Coming down the hill one day, I had that wet leg and stepped in my coat, and I hit the bottom of the hill, and I raised up, and I said, oh, I hurt my leg. I had I said, oh, my leg. I said, just reminds me, oh, I've got one of my leggings to my boy scout suit. <laughs> I put that legging on, that was an excuse, you know. Here I was walking along with one legging on, you know. I went to the blackboard. You remember I used to stand up the old country school at the blackboard, you know? When I got up that day, I put this leg, the one that didn't have the legging. I already had it figured out next to the board. I put this that had the legging like that so they couldn't tell I just had a one. I stood sideways like this working the problem. Everybody's watching that one leg, and all the kiddies got laughing at me, making fun of me, and everything like that. And I started crying. Teacher made me go home. <laughs> that was my leg. I always wanted to be a soldier. When I got old enough to go in the army, of course there was no war then. I remember when I was 17. I signed up in the navy. <laughs> my mother taking that out of me <laughs> when I got home. Then when the next war come, well, they wouldn't have me. But you know what? I finally did join the army. You may not see my uniform, it's on the inside. I joined the Christian ranks of Jesus Christ to be a soldier of the cross. How thankful I am to wear that uniform this afternoon that represents heaven. To join with the rest of you. I was standing there looking at that and thinking about those things as I was leaning across the fence. And I began to think of brother. How I took that handful of popcorn from him when we used to put our hands on one another's shoulders, stand there, and the flag would go up. The teacher was that great big pointer, point, making us get in line. We'd stand tramping like that, going to the school. And I thought, well, look, you know, I used to remember Ralph Field. What happened to him? Yeah, he's gone. And I said, that was Howard Higdon. Yeah, he used to stand by me. What's happened to him? He got blown up down at Colgate. I said, yes, that, that's right. I remember the different one of what had happened to him. I said, now, my brother, Edward, just stood right behind me and put his hand on my shoulder, the one I took the popcorn from. I said, what happened to him years ago? died calling for me. He said, tell Billy. I wasn't a Christian yet. He said, tell Billy, I love him. And someday I'll meet him in heaven. I was, I remember when a ranger rolled out on the prairies and I climbed out of my saddle. He said, is your name Branham? I said, yes, sir. He said, William? And I said, yes, sir. He said, I have a message for you. And he handed it over to me. I read the telegram. Your brother Edward died last night. Mm. 
all right begin to renew. Now that's standing there looking across the fence, I can see that handful of popcorn. Don't ever do nothing wrong. It'll come back to you someday, no matter how little it is. I sit there and tears begin to run down my cheek. I thought, God, I'd give the world, I'd give the rest of my mortal life if you let me take that handful of popcorn and walk up to the door. Lady Edward, buddy, here's that handful of popcorn I cheated you out of that day. I would give anything if I could have took it to him. But he's gone. I looked up across the field where the old house used to stand up there. Well, there's a housing project. Spring dry and gone. I used to think of when we used to had an old piece of a mirror that we drove the nails around it in a tree in a little old wash bench. When Dad used to come in there, about 160 pounds, about five foot seven or eight inches tall, man, oh my, logger, muscles hanging on him like that. I'd see him roll them sleeves up that old blue shirt, old hickory shirt Mom made herself for him, roll it up like that. When he'd go to wash the muscles swelling back and forth, I'd send off, I'd say, that's my dad. <laughs> that's my dad. He'll live a hundred years. That's my daddy. When I'm an old man, I'll still be petting my daddy with big muscles. See? But he died at 52. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I know the old house there was chinked up and what a great house it was. Torn and gone. A housing project. Where is that big, fine bunch of boys? Nearly every one of them is gone. I thought of Rollin Holloway. A friend of mine, a friend of mine, he used to stand there, little red-headed fella, enough temper to fight a bus on, died in prison. He shot a man in a crap game. I looked over here to Wilmer, saw what become of Wilmer Bates. I saw what happened to him. Yes, that's right. What happened to him? He got into a knife fight with a fella and he cut his throat with a knife. I looked back over here and I seen the thought of Willis Paul. What happened to you, Willis? Well, I seen what happened to him. How he went out in a disease that stripped his body. I looked down here and seen each one. I seen them all. Oh, I went, oh God, here I am left alone. Who oh, am I? Where are they at? The first thing you know, standing there, I was screaming out to the top of my voice. Oh God! Let the angels of God come get this poor tired boat. Pack me away from here. This world is not my home any longer. I just come out of that meeting where I was mentally tore up for eight days and nights at the platform. I was shaking and all those things running over. Out oh, here we have no continuing city, but we're seeking one to come. Now I thought, oh God, wife come put her arm around me. Said, now look, honey, you come out here to rest. And here you are standing here crying like a baby. Don't do that. I said, sweetheart, if you knew what was traveling through my heart and mind, I remember standing right here in that house when little Sharon took sick and said, I don't think about that. I've got a real wife. And she called me away and picked up the baby and set it around my shoulders. We went out to the car and drove away. How thinking of things. Sometimes you look and say, oh, Brother Branham, I bet you think you don't know what's behind here, brother. You don't know how many times this poor heart been mashed and crushed and broke and twisted. You don't understand it. That's right. It looks like a flower bed of ease, but don't you think it's Satan that let me get by like that? It would take a week to stand here and tell you what all the things happen. How I've been right down to the age of death's door. And then God is sparing me. How Satan has set snares everywhere, and he's still got him set going right down to the door. But he'll not be able to take me till God finished with me. Then I want to go when he's finished. When I preach my last sermon, the Bible closed for its last time on the pulpit. My last prayer has been offered up to God. I can't do no more for him. Then I want him to come and take me away. That's right. As a boy, I had a very peculiar thing happen. As a little lad, I was called one day after school, about seven years old, by an angel, which told me never to drink or to smoke or to defile my body. And I, 
I, I don't mean this to you sisters now, you see, but if there ever was a woman hater, I was one of them. My, I seen how they come when my daddy run that bootleg place, and I'd see women come there, young women, with somebody else's husband, and the way they would carry on, I said, if that's the way it is, I wouldn't have all the varmints that they'd lull me to one of them. That's right. I, that's true. I thought it. I even, the only respect I had for any woman was my mother. That's right. And I know she was a lady. I seen her sit on the doorstep with the baby's arms and cry and cry and cry because she's locked out of the house. When my dad, which was a real man when he was sober, but then drinking, how, what he would do. And I had a tough life to come up with. I thought, no, I won't have, I, when I was even 17, 18 years old, I'd pass down the street. And if I seen a girl, and I, I thought she was going to speak, not because I just didn't want to have nothing to do with it. I wasn't twisting myself up with them. I went on the other side of the street. I didn't have nothing at all to do with them at all. So I said, I'll, I, here was my thought. When I get to be of age, when my mother is well, the boys are settled down and everything, and I can get enough money somewhere to help take care of my mother, I'm going to Colorado or to Washington State or Canada, and I'm going to be a trapper. I'm going to get me a bunch of dogs. I'm going to get me a bunch of traps, and I'm going to get my rifle, and I'll live there until I die, right in, in the mountains trapping. My grandfather was a hunter on my mother's side, and he, I was natured athlete. And so I said, I just, that's what I'm going to do. I had it in my mind. I said, there isn't going to be any women connected in it at all. So, isn't it funny how you change your mind? <laughs> Strange. One day there was a, as a boy, there's a little girl come along and, you know, <laughs> teeth like pearls, eyes like a dove, neck like a swan. <laughs> Prettiest thing you ever seen. She looked at me and said, hi, dude, Billy. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Another, she knew another boy, a friend of mine, he told me, he said, oh, she likes you. I said, <laughs> well, I, I've kind of made a promise, you know. <laughs> well, I was willing to give in, so <laughs> he said, I'll tell you, I'll take my girlfriend and you take your girlfriend. And said, and we'll take them a ride in my dad's old Ford. He said, if I can get the thing started, he said, how much money can you rake up? I said, I don't know. So we raked up enough to get two gallons of gasoline. We had about 40 cents between us. He said, now, we got to get him something, some soft drinks or ice cream or something. So I said, well, you do the driving of the Ford, and I'll do the buying. So I put the 40 cents in my pocket. <laughs> so he, he he's going to drive the Ford. And we got our old Ford and jacked the back wheel up, you know. And you know how he had to spin him and crank? <laughs> my, my. We got her started, and down the road we went and got our girl. Well, I sat in the back seat, you know, and my look over there. I thought, you know, maybe they're not all that way, but... <laughs> I was changing my mind. <laughs> so she looked over and she said, It's pretty tonight, isn't it? I said, Yes, ma'am. So we stopped in a little place just about a square from where I live right now. A little old place called a little old drive in of a fair. So I said, uh, I w uh, Jimmy Poole and I, we had all made up what we sort of say, you know. And I, I said, Jimmy, I'm kind of thirsty. I, I said, uh, <clears throat> Uh, don't you think we ought to stop? And he said, yes. And so we pulled in. So he says, uh, he said, I'll go get it. He didn't even have a dime. And I had his money. I said, never mind, Jimmy. Just a minute. I'll go get it. So he and I go. Sandwich for, for a nickel. Great big baloney sandwich for a nickel, you know. And got onion and everything on it. So we, we come back out. And I had some coats, you know. And, oh, was we, was we somebody then? We sit there and drink these Cokes, you know, and eat these bologna sandwiches. The girls all we talked, you know, and so then I went back to take the Cokes back. It was just about the time the girls began to act smart, <laughs> began to come smart Ellie, smoking cigarettes. When I come back out, to my surprise, my little queen was smoking a cigarette. Well, I've always had my opinion of a woman who would smoke a cigarette, and I haven't changed it yet. <laughs> It's the lowest thing she ever done. That's right. It's just as bad as drinking. Go ahead. I see your face is getting red. But let me tell you something. Let me tell Mama, it'll be good for you. It'll help you. Now, don't get up. I know that. The rest of them know you're guilty. Look, let me tell you. Mama used to tell me when I was a kid, we had to we'd get our grease. We'd have to boil meat skins in a pan. You know, and we'd have to take a lot of medicine. And every Saturday night, a bath in an old cedar tub and hold her nose and take castor oil. 
every Saturday night. I can't even stand the thoughts of the thing now. And I used to hold my door to gag. I said, oh, Mama, please don't, please don't, that big old spoon, that old greasy looking stuff. And then, Mama, please don't. It makes me so sick. She said, if it don't make you sick, it don't do you any good. Maybe this will help you some, too. Make you right good and sick and you'll stop it. <laughs> That's right. All right, she said. And I, I remember, here sat my little girl sitting there smoking a cigarette. Oh, my. I kind of, uh, she sure dropped in my estimation, man. I said, now she said, begin to blow smoke like that, you know. I thought if the good Lord wanted you to smoke, he'd put a smokestack on you, see. I looked over at her like that, and I looked in front. Here was Jim's girl sitting there doing the same thing, with Jim smoking himself. So I looked around. She said, well, will, you, will you have a cigarette, Billy? I said, no, ma'am. Thank you. I don't smoke. She said, you don't smoke? I said, now you just got through telling me that you didn't dance? I said, no, ma'am. said, that, uh, that uh, you don't smoke? No. And uh, she says, well, what do you like to do? I said, I like to go fishing. I like to hunt. That didn't interest her. So <laughs> she, she said, well, you big sissy. A sissy. My daddy called me that one time because he wouldn't take a drink of whiskey. And I wanted to, but this something wouldn't let me. So I, I said, what was that? And she said, you're a big sissy. And I said, give me a cigarette. And I took that cigarette just as intention to smoke it as I am to finish preaching this service this afternoon. I took it in my hand, trembling like that. I said, give me the, the material with it. And, and she give me the, the thing that you light it with, you know. And I got it all fixed like that. I started to put it in my mouth, shaking like that. And I heard something going, I stopped and I looked around and I thought, that wasn't right. And I, she said, what's the matter? I said, nothing, nothing. I said, I, I'm, I, I'm just trying to light it. And I, I started up to the mouth again. You heard me tell my story the other night, how that whirl in the bush back there, there it was repeating again. I dropped the cigarette. I started crying. She said, now I know you're a sissy. <laughs> I Closed the old tin door on the floor and started up the road crying. Jim drove along in front and said, come on, get in, Bill. I said, no, no. I started walking up the road. She said, why, Billy? She said, you great big sissy, you. She said, I thought you was a man. I said, I thought it was, too. And I just went on up the road like that, walking. I cut across the field, went up there and sat on the field. I said, oh, if there was some way that I could die here. Nobody wants me. I'm not fit for nobody. I said, and the boys, they all like to go to dances and big times, and the girls like to smoke cigarettes, and here I am, a slave of circumstance. What, what, what's, you, what's the end for me in life? What do I live for? And I sat there and I was feeling cried till nearly daylight. On down, I have to hurry to get out of here in time, and I promise you, just skipping the high places. I guess you wondered how I ever got married if I was that bashful. Backwards. I finally I met a girl. It was my boy's mother. The ever was an angel. That was her. I love her, yes. She was a lovely girl. I met her. She was going to church. I looked at her. There was something different from anyone else. I know nothing about Christianity. I was already about 21 years old. I looked at her, she seemed to be every speck of a lady, the way she carried herself and the respect she had. She was going to a Baptist church. And I, I, I went out with her and started going with her, and I was the kind of, went to work for the public utilities of Indiana, and I had gotten a whole little money, and I bought me an old car, and I thought, well, that was a real opportunity, but her father was the president of the Brotherhood on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Or many of you railroads in your mind know Charlie Brumbach just recently went to glory. And a very had a good job. He made about five hundred dollars a month. <laughs> I was making about twenty cents an hour in a bit digging. And me go with a girl like that, oh uh oh, something wrong here. So I went with her for a while and I seen she was every bit of a lady. And I know I had to make my choice now. I, I couldn't let take that girl's time. I loved her too much for that, that I couldn't take her time 
to me because it wouldn't be right to, uh, to spoil her life like that. It, I thought enough of her, if I was as poor as I was, and I didn't have no dad at that time and so forth, and ten children to take care of, and uh, dad left her nine, came with myself, and I thought, how then would I, would I ever be able to support someone like that? And I thought, I've got to make up my mind. I've, I've got to either ask her to, to marry her, or I've got to let her go. And let some good boy that'll take a hold and she'll go with him and marry her, make her a good home and everything, and she'll be happy. And along in that time, I began to study, and I just, while I was going with her, I come to Christ and had found him as my Savior, I was studying in the ministry, the Baptist Church. Then a little, an old time kept going on, and I was ordained then as a, a local elder. Uh, exhorter, and then they had my ministerial license. I thought maybe if I could go to preaching altogether, could I make her a living? So one day I thought, I, I believe, made up my mind, I was going to ask her. How was he going to do it? That was the big problem. How was I going to ask her to marry me? So I said, well, I'll ask her tonight. <clears throat> well, I'd go up and on, I'd talk, and when you get right down to that spot, I, I just willed away. I couldn't do it. I couldn't ask her to marry me. There's too many circumstances there, and I said. Um, so I thought, well, how in the world will I ever get, get it over to her? Maybe I could ask somebody else to ask her if she would marry me, you see. I thought, that wouldn't be just exactly right. She might refuse me on them terms. So you know how I've done it? I wrote her a letter and asked her if she would. So I wrote a letter. Now, it wasn't Dear Miss. You know, it had a little more <laughs> than that. It was a business letter. <laughs> yeah, it was in one way. But I wrote and told her how much I thought of her and asked her if, if, she, would, if she would marry me. And then I thought I'd just hand it to her some night. And I thought, no, I believe I'll put it in the mail. So I put me a stamp on it. And I was going to work, and I stuck it in the mailbox. I had to meet her on Wednesday, and that was on Monday morning. So I wrote the letter and put it in the mailbox, went on to work. And all that week, I was waiting for Wednesday to come to go get my girlfriend who was going to church. So that night, I remember when I started up towards the place to where her people lived, they lived in a lovely big home up there. And I thought, here I live, oh my. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm... I drove up in front, and I thought, I know better than to blow the horn. <laughs> I know her mother and dad would both be out on me. And I think that's right. Uh, that's cheap for you boys to go up and blow the horn for the girl to come out. If you don't think enough of her to go in and talk to her and bring her out and talk to her mother and dad, you, ain't, you ought to be with her anyhow. That's right. Go be a man. So I walked up on the door, and I thought, I'll stay outside tonight. I had to get to thinking. Now, her father was, he was one of the finest men. And her mother's a good woman, and I'm not too sure she might be sitting here this afternoon. <laughs> See, we don't live far from here. And if I say anything wrong now, Miss Bunch, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I just want to tell this truth, you see. So if uh, so I remember we were we were I went up on the porch and her mother at that time she likes me now, but she didn't care too much about me. <laughs> and she was raised in one of those society churches, you know, that stands up in mm, the doxology and, oh my, you know, all that there's going on. Well, that was just a little bit too much. I couldn't digest that. So I, she thought that I was just a little bit narrow-minded, I guess. So I thought, now, having to go to thinking, what, before I got to the house, what if her mother had to get a hold of that letter and read it? Then what would happen? Oh, my. And you know, the devil's there to make me believe that she got the letter, so... I said, oh, what will I do if, if, if she got that letter? Mm. I thought, you know what the best thing me to do? Instead of ringing the doorbell tonight, I believe I'll knock on the door. And just leave my Ford set with the door open, you see. Because how's he going to get away from there? And uh, I could just hear her saying, William Branham? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I, uh, but her daddy was a fine Dutchman. And so I, I went up to the door. I knocked on the door. And the first thing you know, here comes Hope to the door. Her name is Hope. And so I, she came to the door. She said, hello, Billy. And I said, evening. She said, won't you come in? I thought, uh-oh. Get me in there where your mother's at now. And you've both been reading that letter. No. I said, thank you. It's, it's very warm. I said, I'll just sit on the porch. She said, oh, step in. She said, mother and dad wants to see you. And oh, my. I knew then it was up. I thought, here it is. Won't you step in? And I said, oh, well, uh, Oh, my, I know it's over now. So I said, thank you. 
I stepped in, took my hat off, and stood at the door. She said, come on out in the kitchen where Mother and Dad is. But I'll be ready just in a few minutes. Oh, oh, oh. I walked out. I said, how do, Mr. Brumbank? <laughs> how do, Miss Brumbank? I said, hello, Billy. Won't you come out and have a glass of iced tea? I said, thank you. <laughs> I said, I'll, I'll step in here if you don't mind. I said, I'll come out and sit down. Uh, oh, my. My heart was just a jumping as hard as it could. In a few minutes, I, I began to see them. They never mentioned it. They thought about something else. I thought, she never got the letter. All right. Well, then I thought, now the next thing, we better get to church. And so that night, Hope said, let's walk down to the church. And I said, uh-oh. So that night, we walked on down to the church and went in. I never did hear nothing Dr. Davis said. He was preaching a good sermon. But I was sitting there wondering, I thought, boy, she got that letter. The reason she wanted me to walk is because she's going to tell me, this is my last night. I know it. And uh, I was sitting there looking at her, oh, I hate to give her up, my, but I guess she's right because I couldn't I couldn't make her living like her daddy could. And, and there it is. I said, she's got that letter, and oh, my. I never heard nothing the preacher said. I just sat there wondering, oh, I look at her, and she looked more beautiful than she ever did. And I know she's ever with a lady, and I thought, the woman that she does smoke, she doesn't go to dances, she doesn't have, she doesn't use any kind of bad talk, she just, she's just an angel, and I thought, my, uh, that was her, but I, I guess it's all over now. So, after church was over, I started going home, you know, walking along, she's walking along, and I was looking up, you know, when we passed under the trees, the moonlight come down upon her black hair and her brown eyes, I thought, oh my, isn't she pretty? Walking along, I thought, well, I was beginning to get kind of close to the house, I got brave, I thought, the letter hung up the box. None of them got it, see? I was just feeling pretty good, you know. I said, nobody got that letter, so I'm all right. Say, going on like that, and she's talking, you know, and I reached over and tuck a hold of her arm, you know, walking along. Oh, my. And I thought, I I'll have a little more grace. And that letter, I hope it did hang up, and there was nothing happened to it. And I just done made up my mind, and if she'd known anything about it, she'd done said something about it. So we was getting pretty close to the home. Directly, she looked down to me, and she said, Billy? And I said, yes. Yeah. She said, I, I got your letter. Oh. I felt something move up and go down. You know, I said, you did? She said, mm-hmm. Just kept on walking. Never said a word. I thought, woman, say something before I think. Do something, huh? I, I, I can't sit like this all the time. We get too close to the house. She never said a word. I thought, well, I say something. She just, you know how women can keep you. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. I mean, you know what I mean. So, never said a word. Just walked along, you know, looking along up towards the moon and the stars. Oh my, such a suspense. And I said, did you read it? She said, uh huh. Just kept walking on. <laughs> That's all I could get out of her. Well, I thought, my, my, now what? I said, uh, did uh, you uh, appreciate it? <laughs> she said, uh-huh. <laughs> and that's about all I could get out of it. Just, uh-huh. Well, we got married. <laughs> so there you are. So we, we got married. And I never will forget, she asked me just before we was, when we was, before I got her a ring, and I remember I paid $8 for the set. And um, so, I was very happy about it, oh my, I remember we drove out there under the tree and I put that engagement ring on her finger, how happy I was and had the other down in my pocket and put me a great big catch pin there so it wouldn't get out, I was keeping her right there, boy, that was, she's going to be mine, so I went on and on, she said, Billy, before I put the ring on her finger, she said, don't you think it would be kind of gentlemanlike if you would ask dad and mother, I thought, oh my, here it goes again. And she said, I said, yes. I said, look, Hope, I want to tell you something. I said, now, when we get married, it's always to be a 50-50, isn't it? She said, that's right. She said, I'll keep my part. I said, I will mine. I said, let's start it now. She said, what do you mean? I said, you ask your mother and I'll ask your dad. <laughs> I could get by with her dad, but I didn't know about her mother. <laughs> She said, all right. That's all right. And I said, well, uh, <clears throat> look, I said, perhaps you let me ask your dad first. Because I know if her dad said so, I had that much of a promise. She said, I could hold to that. So I remember she said, well, you better ask him tonight. And I thought, oh, kind of quick. 
but I guess I better. So that night we walked in, and he was sitting at his desk just typing out something. I sat there, and she kept nodding her head to me. No, it seems 9 o'clock. It's time I had to go home at 9 o'clock. Now, <clears throat> it's late. So uh, I got up, and I started to the door. And she looked at me kind of strange. Why didn't I ask her daddy? Uh, I don't like that, and she knows what I meant. Her mother's sitting back there doing writing or doing something. I thought, oh, my, I can't ask him right here. If he asked them both, man, they'd have it out right here, and then I'd, I'd be left blank. So I walked to the door, and she walked over to the door with me, and, and um, I said, um, I will come up uh, Wednesday for church. And she said, uh-huh, she kept squeezing my hand. And she pointed to her dad. I said, oh, I couldn't do that. I waited a little bit, and I thought, well, I got to. I said, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Brumback, he's typing along, you know, he said, yeah? I said, could I speak to you out here just a minute? <laughs> he said, yes, Bill, why? What do you want? <laughs> I said, could I talk to you out here just a minute, Mr. Brumback? And he said, um, sure. He looked over to his wife. His wife looked over to him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> So I seen Hope walk over towards her mother. So I walked out on the porch. <clears throat> I got out there. And I, I done got too much nervous shock then, you know. So I said, he said, what do you want, Bill? And I said, sure is warm tonight. He said, sure is. I said, but Charlie, it's a pretty night, ain't it? He said, yes, it is. I said, uh, you know, um, uh, I said, I was, um, he said, yes, you can have her, Bill. <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of him yet today. <laughs> I said, do you mean that I can? He said, yes. Oh, my, I took all that big old fat hand of his. I said, Charlie, look. I said, you know I'm a parper. I said, your girl can dress nice and everything. And I have one suit of clothes. I said, but all my life I've been a vagabond. I've been searching for someone that I thought was a queen, one that I thought was a lady. I said, I found that in the hope. I said, I, I can't make her a living like you will. Certainly not, Charlie. You make $500 a month. And I'm making about $14 a week. I said, I got nine down there in the family. Some of them beginning to work now. I said, which uh, will give me a release. But Charlie, I thought that there's no need to be taking much more of her time. As soon as the other boys get jobs and things, she can help me with take care of my mother. Uh, I'll do everything that I can. I'll work, Charlie, as long as there's breath in my body. I'll slave and do everything I can because I really love her. And I'll do all that I can to be good to her. I'll live true to her. I'll do everything I can. I never forget, the man's gone on now. He put that big arm around me and pulled me up close to him, just about the size of Brother Baxter. He reminds me a lot of him. He pulled me up to me like this. He said, Billy, he said, I'd rather you'd have her on them grounds than somebody that would mistreat her, no matter how much money you had. He said, you'll be more happy. He said, happiness does not consist of how much the world's good you own, but how contented you are with the potion that's lauded to you. I said, thank you, Charlie. Thank you. She had asked her mother, and I don't know what happened in there, but anyhow, we got married. <laughs> so when we got married, it was it was a marvelous uh, little old, I remember we was married down here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We went home. I didn't even have, you know what, we, I rented a house for $4 a month. You can imagine what kind of a house it was. $4 a month, someone give us an old folding bed. How many know what an old folding bed is? My, I seen Brother Ryan put up his hand. He slept on it enough. He ought to know. So he um, gave us an old folding bed. Mama gave us a little old iron bedstead. A little later on, we first we had two rooms, and I went down to Sears and Roebuck and got me a, a breakfast set that didn't wasn't painted. I think it cost us about three or four dollars, and I painted it yellow with a great big green shamrock on each one. And she was laughing at me. I'll never forget it about being an Irishman and painting the shamrock and so forth. And we didn't have very much of the world's goods. I went over to Mr. Weber, a junk dealer, and I bought me a stove for 75 cents, and it cost me a dollar and a quarter to put new grates in it. I fixed it up, and we went to housekeeping. Well, we were happy. 
We didn't have very much of the world's goods, but we sure had one another, and the love of God was in our heart, and that's all we cared about. And I'll tell you, that's what really means something now. Yes, sir. I look around, I heard somebody say, isn't that a beautiful home? I said, I don't know. Home is not the house, it's the order of the house that makes the home. That's what makes home. No matter if it's a shanty, whatever it is, if, if, if the order is right on the inside and godly, it's more of a home than if you had a palace somewhere. I'd rather live in a shanty and be happy than to live in a palace and be unhappy. That's right. So I remember then very well, we went ahead and after a while, God gave us one of the greatest little gifts about a year after we were married. My poor little boy, which is standing in the back of the building now, he, little Billy Paul, he came into the world. And I remember how we'd go on. I was cutting up with her, and I said, now, look, you know what we're going to call this? Yeah, I said, I believe you'll be a boy. If it is, I said, now, for German, she was a German, and, and I was an Irish, and I said, we'll call him Heinrich for German, and Michael, Heinrich Michael. She said, oh, Bill, my, that sounds horrible. <laughs> so I, uh, we went ahead, and we was going on like that. And when God brought us to a little boy, how happy we were together. Went on, and life went on. After a while, John Ryan back there come into my life. I met him. He asked me to come to Dwarjack one day, where, where he lives over in Dwarjack, Michigan, to go on a, a little vacation. We saved our money and everything, and I had about, oh, maybe 10 or $12 saved up. I'm fixing to come to the end of the story now, just in a little bit. I know I'm holding you just, I got about 10, 12 more minutes to be out on time. But we come to the wall, Jack. I tried to hold myself up and hit the high spots now. I pray for me. When I went to the wall, Jack, with Brother Ryan back there, I went to his home, a little humble home, about like I lived in. His wife, but she would swear by him. He had a fine boy, and so they made me very welcome. And on my road back home, Going back home, I come to Mishawaka, and I looked out there, and there was a group of people swarmed out there, and cars, and Cadillacs, and Fords, and cops trying to keep order around, and I thought, what's going on here? And I hear this singing, you know, and going on, my, everybody screaming and hollering, I thought, well, is it a funeral, or what's going on? Is it a church house? And I stops and goes in. Come to find out, it was a convention where there was a group of the Pentecostal people was holding a convention over there, and they had to hold it in the north because of uh, uh, the race uh, conditions. They couldn't hold it, and it was an international convention. They was holding it in a big tabernacle at Mishawaka. So I had never seen the Pentecost before, so I thought, well, I believe I'll go and see what it looks like. So I walked in, and there they was, all clapping their hands. Like that, and a screaming and a singing. I thought, what manners? Never seen anything like that in my life. What are they all talking about? And here was a colored man up there, and he was singing, and he was saying, I know it was the blood, and all the congregation, I know it was the blood. And here he'd run down through there and grab somebody up and hug them like that, white colored and all. Said, I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me. Running up and down the aisle, and I thought, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And how I said that, and somebody jump up and scream and speak in tongues. I thought, say, what is this anyhow? And then a preacher got up there, and he got to preaching about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it looked like his fingers about that long, and he poured me out right back in the back. He was talking to me, and I thought, say... How'd that guy know anything about me, see? And all oh, there was hundreds and or oh, thousands, two or three thousand, I guess, in the, uh, all together in a meeting. And some uh, group from up here in Chicago, a colored group, they come up called Locust Grove or Piney Wood or something like that, a quartet that I never heard such singing in my life. Well, I thought there's one thing you have to say about them people. They're not ashamed of their religion. That's one thing, sure. Uh, they're, they're not ashamed of it. So I thought, you know, I believe I'll come back tonight. I went out and counted my money. I had just enough to get enough gasoline to come back and 20 cents left. Well, I know how much gasoline to take now. I couldn't get a tourist court, so I thought I'll sleep out there in a cornfield. So I went out and got me 20 cents worth of stale rolls. And I thought I can live on them for a couple of days, but I want to find out what this is all about. So I went out and got my rolls and put them in the back of my car. And my 
went over then, uh, that night. He said, I want all ministers, uh, the spokesman said, I want all ministers to come to the platform. There's just about, I guess, about a, two or three hundred of them at the platform. They were all white colored and all sitting on the platform. He said, now, we haven't got time for you to preach. We just want you to come right down the road and just say who you are, where you're from. When it come to my place, I said, Evangelist William Branham, Jeffersonville, Indiana. Sit down. Next, 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 on like that. Come to find out, I was the youngest man was there. I was 23 years old, man, or youngest man at the, at the platform. I didn't know what at that time. The next morning, well, then we went on that night, and I want to tell you what happened that night. I heard all the ministers preaching that day about, all oh, the deity of Christ and the great messages about his walk on life and his sacrifice and so forth and all the different things. But that night they brought an old colored man out, just a little bit of rim of white hair around the back of his head here, great big long felt preacher's coat on, one of the old-fashioned long frock tail coats with a velvet collar. Poor old fella walked out there like this. I thought, that poor old man. Isn't that a shame? I said, poor old dad. I said, I guess he's preached a long time. He stood there. And I'd never seen a microphone before. I was a country preacher. So they had a microphone hanging up. There's something new then, you know. So this old fellow got before him. He said, dear children. Uh-oh. He said, I was going to take my text tonight from back in, in Job. He said, where was you when I laid the foundation of the world? <laughs> Declare unto me where they, they're passing to. And so when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. <laughs> I thought, that poor old fellow, his preaching days are about finished. He's old. See. Instead of coming down on the earth with it like this, brother, he went back at her about 10 million years before the foundation of the world was ever laid. He climbed up into the sky. <laughs> And he preached about what went on in the skies, the sons of God shouting for joy. He'd come on down through the dispensations and brought him back on the horizontal rainbow back here, back over in the millennium. And about that time, he got all happy. And when he did, he went, whoopee, just up in the air, kicked his heels together. The glory to God said, hallelujah, there's not enough room here for me to preach. And off the platform, he walked like that, like a kid. I said, brother, if it'll make an old man act like that, what would it do for me? I want that. That's what I want. That's what my heart hunger for. It'll make an old man act like that. I, that's what I wanted. I said, oh, my, them people's got something. That night I went out in the cornfield, and I thought, I better press my trousers, so I took the two seats of my old Ford and put them together, laid my trousers back and forth like this, and put the seats down to press them, laid down in some grass over the side of the field out here somewhere in Indiana, out here, and I laid there under that little old cherry tree that night, and I prayed, God, somehow or another, give me favor with them people. That's what I want. Baptist or no Baptist, that's what I want. That's what my hunger is parts of feeling far, that's what it's reaching for. There's the people that I've wanted to see all my life. Next morning I went out, nobody knew me, you know, so I put on my little steer sucker trousers and put a t-shirt on. Nobody knew I was a preacher, so I went out, I sat down, and when I sat down, here come a colored brother up and sat down inside of me, and over here sat a lady. And I, I sat down there until they got up that morning just playing the music and everything, and there's a brother his daughter come out and played a trumpet, uh, Witherspoon, I believe was his name. And he, and he a girl played the most beautiful uh, blue Galilee that I, I sat there and cried like a baby. And I was sitting there, then up to the platform come a minister by the name of Kurt. He said, last night at the platform, the youngest minister we had here was an evangelist by the name of William Branham, said from Jeffersonville, Indiana, said, we want him to speak this morning. Oh, my, my congregation, I thought, and sear sucker trousers and a t-shirt. So I just hunkered down real low like this, you know. In a few minutes, he waited a few minutes, he got to the microphone again, he said, if there's anybody here knows where William Branham from Jeffersonville, an evangelist, was on the platform last night, we want him this morning to bring the message this morning, tell him to come to the platform. I stood down real low, you know, like Way down low, I thought, sear sucker trousers, you know, and t-shirt, so I got real low, and I didn't want to get up for them people anyhow. They had something that I didn't know nothing about, so I just sat real still. Directly that colored man looked around me and said, hey, you know him? Uh-oh. <laughs> something had to happen. I didn't, I, didn't to, I didn't want to lie to the man. I said, look, fella, listen, I'll tell you something. I said, I'm he, see. He 
said, I thought you were getting down there kind of low about something. And I said, well, look. I said, are you a minister? He said, yes, sir. I said, he said, go on up there, fella. And I said, no, no, look, 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 look. I said, I want to tell you something. I said, uh, I, I, I got on these steer sucker trousers and these t-shirts. I said, I don't want to get up there. He said, damn people don't care what you dress like, man. Get on up there. And I said, no, no, thank you, sir. And somebody said, has anybody ever found Reverend Brown? He said, here he is. Here he is. <laughs> I had my Bible under my arm, and I walked up to the platform, kind of sheepish looking, you know, and scared to death. I walked up, and I thought, oh, my, last night I was praying all night to give me favor. Now, if God's going to let me get up before him, if I ain't going to get up, then how am I going to get favor? So I got, I thought, oh, not a thing on my mind. I was scared and trembling. I never, didn't know how close to stand to that little old microphone hanging with a string hanging down like that. I didn't know how to stand by that and all this great big tabernacle, you know. And I said, well, folks, I said, I, I don't know very much about the, the way you preach and things. I said, I just, uh, uh, I was coming up the road, and, and I, I didn't know, and I had to turn over there to Luke to the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell. <laughs> and he seen Lazarus fall off, and then he cried. I took my text, and then he cried. And I got, got to talking, and I said, then the rich man down in hell, there was no church. Then he cried. And I said, there was no children. Then he cried. There was no song, then he cried. There was no God, then he cried. Now I got started, people got screaming, then I cried. Oh, way it went, and the first thing you know, everybody on their feet, then he cried, and then he cried. And the next thing I knew, I was out in the yard. <laughs> well, I don't know what happened. <laughs> everybody was blessing God and carrying on the congregation, screaming and shouting, I don't know what i done. <laughs> I just lost myself somewhere. <laughs> First thing you know, up come a great big fellow from Texas, a big ten gallon hat on and cowboy boots, walked up and said, Say, are you a evangelist? I said, Yes, sir. He said, How about coming down to Texas and holding a revival? I said, well, Are you a preacher? He said, Sure. I looked at that big high heel boot and that great big cowboy hat. I thought, Maybe it doesn't make any difference. But next thing a fellow walked up, had a little golf pants like this. He said, Say, he said, I'm from Florida. He said, I have so many saints down there at a church or somewhere. He said, I'd like you to hold me. I said, are you a preacher? He said, yes, sir. <laughs> I thought, well, my dear sucker trousers and t-shirt ain't so much out of line as they're all around this place around here. So I began to look at it. We had a clerical coat and collar and everything we wore, you know. So they, I thought, well, that's all right. So uh, then a woman stepped up from up around somewhere, way up in the northern part of Michigan. She was with the Indians. She said, I just know while you was preaching, the Lord told me that you should come and help me up there with the Indians. I said, just a minute. Let me get a piece of paper. And I went to write down these names and addresses, and my head string them that long, last in a year. My, was I happy. Out of there, I went and jumped in my old Ford, and down the road we went to Jeffersonville, as hard as we could go. 60 miles an hour. 30 this way and 30 up and down that way, just as hard as we could go. Right down the road of flying as hard as we could to go to Jeffersonville. I jumped out of the car and my wife always, she'd come and run to meet me. And she said, what you so happy about? I said, honey, you just don't realize. I said, I met the happiest people in the world. She said, well, where are they at? I told her all about them. And I said, looky here, let me show you something. You wouldn't believe that this preacher... Boy, friend of yours, look here. All that people ask me this whole line down through Texas, Louisiana, and everywhere, come preach for them. See there? I said, I prayed all night under a cherry tree out there. And God told me, so what kind of, what do they act like? I said, oh, don't ask me. I said, they just act anyway. And so uh, she said, oh, my. I said, and I, she said, I said, and they asked me to go, I'm going to quit my job and go to preaching. Right out with them. Leave my church. She said, uh, well... I said, will you go with me? God bless her heart. She said, I promise to go with you anywhere, and I'll go anywhere that you go. That's a real wife. She's in her grave today. But still, I'm glad that I say this, and her son, her my son standing listening, his mother was a queen. And I, I said, well, look, uh, uh, I, said, we, I said, we'll tell her parents. I went and told Mama. I said, Mama, looking here, and I told her about people. She said, you know what? Said, Billy, a long time ago down in Kentucky, we had what they'll call the old Lone Star Baptist. 
said, and they used to shout and scream and carry on like that. She said, that's real heartfelt religion. I said, that's what I've believed in all my life. And I said, you ought to see him. She said, well, I trust that God will bless you, Bill. I said, all right. So we went to tell her mother then. And during this time, her mother and father had separated. And I said, we went to tell her mother. And I said, Mrs. Uh, Miss Brumbach, I said, uh, I have found a wonderful people like that. And she was sitting on the porch, you know. <laughs> now, don't get mad at me if you're here. <laughs> so she said, uh, she was sitting on the porch standing. She said, William, I'll give you to understand. I'll never give my daughter permission to go out with a bunch of holy rollers like that. Oh, my. She said, that bunch of trash said she'd never have a decent dress to put on her back. I said, well, Miss Brumbach, it isn't a dress proposition. I said, the thing of it is, is I feel that God wants me to do it. And she said, look, why don't you go up there to church where you've got a congregation coming and think about getting yourself a parsonage and a place to take your wife and baby to. And instead of pulling her out today, she's got something to eat and tomorrow she's got nothing and things like this. She said, never indeed will I ever permit my daughter to go like that. And if she does go, her mother will go to a grave brokenhearted. And Hope said, Mama, you mean that? And she said, that's just what I mean. That settled it. Hope started crying. I put my arm around her and walked away. I said, but Mrs. Brumbach, she's my wife. She said, but she's my daughter. I said, yes, ma'am. I walked away, went on. She looked at me and Hope did. She said, Bill, that's my mother, but I'll go with you. See? I said, God bless her heart. She said, I'll go with you. I said, honey, uh, I said, I guess I'm carrying water on both shoulders, but I said, I don't want to hurt her feelings. She said, she said I said, what if something happened to her and then you'd be worried all your life? You, you broke your mother's heart. I said, maybe we'll just put it off a little while. And friends, there's where I made the worst step I ever made in my life right there. We put it off. About a few weeks after that, things begin to happen. The flood come on later from that. And the first thing you know, wife got sick. Billy got sick doing that wrong right after that. The little girl, just 11 months difference between Billy and his little, his little sister, which was Sharon Rose. I wanted her name her Bible name, so I couldn't call her Rose of Sharon, so I called her Sharon Rose. And I, I named her that. She's a darling, lovely little thing. And the first thing you know, the flood came up. She was laying there with pneumonia. And our doctor, Dr. Sam Adair, came, and he's a brother to me. He looked at her and said, Bill, she's seriously ill. He said, don't you go to bed right at Christmas time. He said, don't you go to bed tonight. You give her uh, orange juice all night long. Make her drink at least two gallons a night to break that fever. She got a fever, 105. And said, you must break that fever right away. I said, all right. And I set up and gave her orange juice all night. The next morning, the fever was a little lower. So her mother came up, and she just didn't like Dr. Adair at all. She liked another doctor there in the city. And she said, I'm going to take her down home. This house is not, is not equipped with heat and stuff for say. I said, well, I'd rather ask a Dr. Adair if we should move her. She said, he ain't got sense enough to know how to come in out of the rain. She said, I wouldn't ask him nothing. She said, I'll get a doctor. A doctor, I said, but look, we shouldn't, we, we don't. And I called Dr. Adair. He said, Bill, don't you move her. He said, if you do, it'll kill her. I said, take her out in that cold, it's sub-zero weather right now, come down to that place and change them rooms for her. I said, don't you do that. But, of course, there it was. And I called and I said, she go do it anyhow. So then I'll get off the case, Bill. I love you as, as a brother, you know that. But I'll have to leave the case and turn it over to Dr. Baldwin. And I said, well, <laughs> Doc, you know where my feeling is. I said, I... So I went down there and I knelt down and prayed. I went over to the church when I started to pray. It looked like a black sheet come moving down in front of me. I went over and I said, I don't think she'll ever come from the bed. And all of them said, oh, Billy, you just think. I said, the same thing that happened about that flood, I said, is the same thing as telling me about my wife. I said, I don't believe she'll come to bed. I said, oh, I believe it's your wife, and you just, that's the way you feel about it. But, oh, my, a little later on, I'll never forget how that was. Oh, it went on for a little bit. She got worse, worse. Finally, the flood come up, and I was on a rescue party out there. I had a speedboat. I was trying to get people out, and I remember one night they took her, they took her to the hospital and put her over here in, in a place with the government, and her and both babies were sick, horribly sick, and I'll never forget that fatal night when the flood walls broke through down there. 
I heard a scream way back over on Chester Street, and I had a speedboat. And I got out there and tried to get a mother out there. Just as I picked her up, she fainted. I picked her up in my arms and put her in a boat about 11 o'clock. But the baby's in there, and when I got her back to shore, she began to scream, my baby, my baby. She had a baby there about two years old. I thought she meant she had another little baby out there next place. And back I went to try to get the baby. I tied my boat up the side of the pillar of the porch. And when I went up into the room to try to look around for the baby, I heard the house giving away below. And I run down real quick just in time to jump into the water and hold on to the end of my boat and pull the mist sub-zero, sleet and snowing. I pulled a rope like that and got in my boat. The waves caught it and swept me out into the middle of the current, out into the river. And I got back in there and I couldn't get my boat started. The old chain of a pull on the outboard motor, you know, the old timers where he had a whirl on the top of it. And I'd pull and pull and I couldn't get the thing started. And there was the Ohio Falls roaring just below me. Oh, brother, a way of a transgressor's hard. You never think that. And I pulled and it wouldn't start, and I pulled again and it wouldn't start. And I tried, and I got out on the boat, I said, God, it is but a few more jumps down here, and I'll sink beneath those falls there where they're roaring and bubbling, miles of water stretching through there. I said, I got a sick wife and two babies laying out there in the hospital. I said, please, dear God, start this border. I could think, uh-huh, never let my girl go out with a bunch of that trash. And I say this is all due respect to every church. I find out what she calls trash is the cream of the crop. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I pulled on that, and I kept roaring in my ears. And I pulled again, and I, just a few minutes, and it started, and I had to pull right back upstream and give it all the gas that it could. Finally, I landed down almost to New Albany, just whirling the edge of those falls. I got back in and run back up to the hospital to see where my wife was, and the blood had done tucked this thing away. It was gone. Now, where was my wife? Where was my baby? Wet and cold. I ran out there, and I met Major Weekly. I just, Brother Ryan had just left somewhere. I don't know where he went. I think he went with Brother George and them on out. I met Brother George last time I seen him in life. He put his arms around me and said, Brother Billy, with all my heart, he was a converted medium. And he said, with all my heart, I love Jesus Christ, and if I never see you again, I'll see you in the morning. I said, God bless you, George. As he went on, he was trying to find Brother Ryan then somewhere. Oh, he was in the city. And then I tried to find hope. I couldn't find someone said, no, there was no one drowned in that group. Said they all got on a train and went out to Charleston. Well, I jumped in my car and started to Charleston. When I did that creek back there, it cut off about five miles of solid water down through there. Some of them said, no, the train got halfway out there and it washed off the trussles out there. They all drowned out there off of that trussle. Said it went out on a cattle car. My wife, her father, one of the heads down there on the railroad, and his daughter with double pneumonia and two babies with pneumonia laying in the cattle car in the sleet and rain of blowing on the road or somewhere and washed out in the water. I tell you, brother, there's a whole lot when God calls you to do anything. Don't you let no one stand in your way. You keep God first. And I tried to find, I couldn't get away and got my speedboat and tried to get out into ch towards Charleston. I couldn't even touch the waters. The world would swing me plumb back. And I thought I was a pretty good boatman, and I tried it after times was almost breaking day, and no success at all there. It was gone. Then I was in the room, then found myself on a little island sitting out there for three or four days. I sat alone there where they had to drop me something to eat. I had a long time to think over whether that was a bunch of trash or not. Or to mind some woman, or to mind what God said, no matter who it was, you listen to what God's got to say. And there, after a while, after I got across the waters, it dropped up. I went to see where my wife was. They told me she was in Charleston. Got there, she wasn't there. And old Colonel Hay just went to glory recently. He put his arm around me, said, let's go down to the railroad station. When I went down there, broken hearted, crying, I didn't know what to do, oh my. I thought babies are probably laying drifted off down there somewhere in some brush pile. The wife may be laying down there also. Oh, how I cried and begged and repented and told God, look, friends, I believe if I'd have went on right then or I was mixing up with that bunch of people who believed in the supernatural, the angel of God would have come to me and reveal that thing. There'd have been thousands times thousands of more people in glory because of it. See, that's the reason I go day and night and never worry and put my whole strength because I've got to redeem the time. I've got to do it. 
And so when I finally someone come and got me, said, no, they're not drowned Billy. I know where they're at. They're Columbus, Indiana, in the Baptist church. And I, they take me up there, and I run down through that hall that night, screaming at the top of my voice. I didn't care who heard me. Oh, oh, where are you, honey? Way down through there, and all the refugees back there, all the little cots and blankets hanging up. And I have to look way down there at the end. I've seen a bony hand holding up like that. I rushed real quick, pair of boots on, fell down there and threw my hat off. Looked down there, and there laid my sweetheart dying. Her hand moving up, her jaw sunk back about three weeks or more before I'd found her. Her eyes were way back. I put my hands over on her. She said, I know I look horrible, Bill. I said, honey, you look all right. She said, now don't tell me that, honey. I said, oh, God, have mercy. I said, where's the baby? She said, Mama and them's got him over there, Billy. I said, is Billy alive? I said, yes. I said, Sharon alive? I said, yes. I said, oh, thanks be to God. I said, I heard from Mama. Mama's alive. She's over at some other place. I said, I heard by radio, but I couldn't hear from you nowhere. And I said, oh, honey. And she said, I said, uh, you, and I felt somebody tap me on the shoulder. I looked up. He's a very smart looking man. He said, Reverend Branham. And I said, yes, sir. I said, a sign. And I walked over there and said, aren't you a friend of Dr. Sam Adair? And I said, yes. He said, you're a wife. I'm informed to tell you I'm a, the doctor here. He said, I'm informed to tell you your wife has galloping TV. She just has a few days to live. I said, she's going to die. I said, no, doc. No, no, that isn't so. He said, oh, yes, it is, Reverend Manham. It is. So I said, it can't be, doctor. You mean she's... Uh, uh, he said, yes. And said, you'll be a very lucky man if your children pull through. He said, I'm tending to the children also. And I said, oh, God, have mercy. He said, now, don't break down before her. I said, all right, sir. All right. I said, thank you very much. Where is Dr. Sam? He said, I don't know where he's at. And I said, uh, thank you, doctor. And I said, I, I, let me go back to her. I said, just to be with her as much as I can. I said, I, I, I won't break down. And I walked back nervously. I looked at her, those pretty black eyes sitting way deep back there in her hair and her forehead. Oh, I think she was going. I looked over and I said, oh, sweetheart, uh, you, you look all right. And she said, oh, maybe God will have mercy and let me live, Bill. And I said, I hope he does, sweetheart. And so a few days I got her out of there, got her down to Jeffersonville to the home, and she kept getting worse and worse, worse and worse. The two children began to get better, but she got worse. And after a while, Dr. Dare, he tried everything he could. He sent to Louisville to a specialist of TB, brought over, and he said, well, if you had a nematoric machine, I went and borrowed the money and got a nematoric machine, and we'd give her the treatments when you know what nematoric is, the clap the lung, you know, like that. And I'd hold her poor hand, and it would grip so that it'd bore that hole in there and puff out the lung. And if I had it to go over again, I'd never let her suffer like that. And so trying, but they were working hard to save her life. Finally took her out to the hospital for x-ray. Here it come right on up, that tuberculosis pneumonia coming right off, filling up the lung. He said, you just got a few days, Reverend Branham. There's nothing in the world can be done. She's going to die, but Almighty God has called for her to answer. Oh, how could I stand that? How could I believe? How could I do it? I looked down there and early, my little Sharon Rose, a little suckling baby, about 11 months old. Here's little Billy Paul, just about 18 months old, little bitty fella. And to them, without a mother and me, oh, what could I do? I just couldn't believe it all. I walked the floor, I cried. I, I've done everything. I tell you, brother, you better mind God when God speaks to you. You do what he tells you, and I walk back and forth. Finally come the hour. I was out in the car, and I heard him call me, that I must come to the hospital at once. My wife was dying, said she couldn't live any longer. I rushed to the hospital real quick, threw off my coat, run up the steps, and when I did, I'll never forget it. Little doctor right there, a fine little fella, and he come walking down the room. We fished together, we hunt together, we slept together, we were bosom buddies, and he's, he's a specialist. And he come walking down the hall with his head down. And he had to look standing high there and he'd see me and tears rolled down his cheeks and he ducked off into a room. I run down the hall real quick and pulled open the door. He put his arm around me and said, Billy boy. Dang. I said, what is it, Doc? He said, I just can't tell you, Bill. I said, just go ahead out and let the nurse tell you. I said, come on, doctor. What is it? He said, she's gone. I said, she isn't gone, Doc. I said, yes, she's gone. I said, Doc, go with me to the room, will you? He said, Bill, I can't do that. He said, oh, 
Paul, we, well, we just like my sister. He said, I, I can't go in that room again. So just then a nurse come in. She said, Reverend Branham, here's some medicine. I want you to take this. I said, I don't want your medicine. And she said, I went out to the room. She said, I'm going with you. I said, no, let me go alone. I said, let me go in and see her. I walked in. I said, is she gone? I said, I, I think she is. Said Dr. Dare left a few minutes ago and said there's nothing more could be done. She was gone. So I opened the door, walked in. I looked laying there, and she had her eyes closed. Her mouth was open. Her little body was drawn down to about 100 pounds, less than that, all like this. And I put my hand over on her forehead. It was sticky like. I said, oh, sweetheart, will you answer me? I said, will you, will you answer me, honey? I said, will you speak to me just one more time? I said, God, I know I've been wrong. But if you just let her speak to me one more time, will you, Lord, please let her speak? And while I was praying, I looked. I'll live to be 100 years old. I'll never forget that. Those big, dark eyes opened up, and she looked at me. She motioned for me to get down. I looked at her. I said, sweetheart, you're all right, aren't you? She said, why did you call me, Bill? Why did you call me? I said, what do you mean? She said, oh, I was so easy. She'd been suffering so hard. And I said, what do you mean easy, honey? She said, well, she said, Bill, you know I'm going, don't you? And I said, no. She said, I am. And she said, Bill, I don't mind it. She said, you know why I'm going, don't you? And I said, no. She said, Bill, you remember the day we went up to Mother and that bunch of people who... I said, I know it, honey. She said, we ought not to have did that. Oh, then grinding my heart. Just then the nurse ran the door and said, Reverend Benham, you better take this. She motioned the nurse. She took me by the hand. She said, Louise, we knew them all well. She said, Louise, Adel. She said... I hope when you get married that you have a husband like mine. She said, he's been so good to me. She said, I hope. And Louise, she, she just couldn't stand it. She set the medicine down and went out of the room. And I said, honey, are you going? She said, I was being taken home, Bill. But there was someone dressed in white standing on each side of me. I was going down a big, beautiful path. And said, is peaceful? And the big palm trees like an orient and the big birds the flying from tree to tree said it was such a beautiful place. You know what I think? I think God let her break into paradise just as she was going over. And she said, you know, Bill, that religion that we've been talking about since we received the Holy Ghost. And I said, yes. She said, don't never cease to preach that. She said, stay with that. She said, that's the thing. And I said, honey, if I would have probably listen. She said, yes, Bill. She said, now look, honey. She said, I'm going fast. She said, but remember, that wonderful Holy Spirit that we received, she said, it's taking me through. She said, promise me this, honey, that you will never, never cease. You'll never let up. You'll always stand true to that. She said, it's wonderful in death. And I said, I, I will she said, I got a few things for me to promise. I said, what is it, honey? She said, you remember that time when we was in Louisville and you was going on that hunting trip and you wanted to buy that little 22 rifle? I said, yes. I said, you didn't even have enough $3 to make the down payment? I said, yes, I'm very fond of rifles and things. It's a uh, sport to me and a recreation, I should say. And I, I said, I remember that. She said, honey, I've tried my best to save our nickels and things to get it for you. She said, after I'm gone, you go home. And right on the top of that old folding bed where Brother Ryan slept, she said, right up on top there under the newspaper, you'll find the money that I've saved. She said, I've cut that out of allowance for my clothes and things that you'd let me have. She said, to save it so I can get enough for a down payment to get you that rifle. You'll never know how I felt when I looked over there and seen two dollars and seventy cents, nickels and dimes, to buy the rifle. She said another thing. She told me about some stockings that I bought her one time. 
I didn't know how to buy stockings. And I called it stocks and I got the wrong kind. She told me that it was the wrong kind. And she'd give them to my mother because it wasn't the kind of that she wore. And she said, another thing I want you to promise me. Now, what's that? She said that you won't live single. I said, oh, oh, don't please, please don't ask me, honey. She said, look, Bill. She said, in heaven, there'll be no marriage or given in there. She said, I got two little babies here I'm leaving you with. And she said, I don't mind going, but I hate to leave you. She said, I hate to leave Billy Paul and Sharon. She said, but Billy, if, if they're raised up in you, the ministry, and they be pulled about from pillar to post, she said, find some good girl, some good girl that's got the Holy Ghost. Said, let her be in my place as a mother. I thought of a 22-year-old woman going like that. I couldn't promise her. I said, honey, I, I, I just can't promise that. I, I, I can't do it. She said, you wouldn't let me go unhappy. I said, no. I said, I'll just do the best I can. She said, Bill, hey, they're coming back. I said, don't think I'm beside myself. I'm not. She said, but I feel them coming near. They're coming after me. I stepped back, looked at her. I said, sweetheart, if you're going, all right, I'll take your body out here on Walnut Ridge Graveyard, and I'll make a mound. And I'll put you in there. And I said, then, if Jesus comes before I go, I'll be somewhere on the battlefield preaching the Holy Ghost gospel. And I said, if I sleep, I'll be by your side. And I said, look, honey, for my last date with you, my sweetheart, I said, when the great early white city comes roaring down from God out of heaven and the moon and sun stand each other black dripping with blood, we don't believe in death of Christians. You can't prove to me that a Christian dies. The blood of Jesus Christ takes away sin. It doesn't cover it. The believer goes to the presence of God now. Now, I said, honey, if I'm asleep that day, if, if I'm awake, you'll come first, for they which are dead in Christ shall rise first. I said, you run quickly up to the side of the city gate. And I said, when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and them coming, I said, you start screaming in my name to the top of your voice, Bill, Bill, as loud as you can. And I said, I'll get Sharon and Billy and get them together, and I'll meet you there at the gate before we go in. She took hold of my hand. She squeezed it. I raised down and kissed her goodbye. She said, my angel eyes looked up at me again and said, take it away. She said, I'll be waiting for you at the gate. God took her precious soul to glory. There I stood, looking down. What could I do, my sweetheart, no? The very part of my heart pulled away. I went out there to go home, took her body down to the undertaker's establishment. She was in bonds, and I went home, tried to go to sleep. I couldn't do it. After a while, a man knocked at my door and said, Billy? I said, yeah. But I hate to tell you this. I said, well, Brother Frank, I was right out there when she died. I said, that's not it. Said, your baby's dying also. I said, who, Billy? Said, no, Sharon. I said, surely not. Said, Dr. Dare has just come, got her and took her to the hospital. She has two burger meningitis. There's not a chance they said she'll be dead in a little bit. She's perfectly healthy. I rushed to the cook. They had to hold me. Sent me in an old Chevrolet truck. He and his boy, I just couldn't hold myself together. My heart was breaking. Away at the hospital, I went, went in. There's the nurse in our river bed, you can't go down in there. We got an isolated ward, said you'll give Billy Paul the same thing, but you can't go out, said I must see my baby. She said, you can't go to river bed, it's two birds from meningitis, she's picked it up from my mother, it's in the spine and she's dying now. And said, if you go in there, said it's dangerous to take it to the bed of your boy. And said, you cannot go in. And she said, go in the room. And I went to the room. When she shut the door, I went right out behind the door and went right on down to where it was. Very poor hospital. I looked there and it put a little rag over its eyes, little mosquito bars, they call it. Flies that got his eyes was down in the basement of an isolated ward. I walked in and looked at my baby. There she lay. My sweetheart. Her little teeny baby blue eyes looking up at me. 
little legs, little fat legs laying there with her little corners on, you know, she was, her little legs was moving up and down like a little spasm, her little hand, like it was waving to me. I said, Sharon, you know, Daddy? And her little lips started quivering, and she was suffering so hard that one of those little blue eyes crossed over like that. Oh, fuck. When I think of it, I can't stand to see a cross like child. You know, sometimes God has to take a flower to crush it to bring the perfume out. I was going to see a cross like child, I think of that. I've never seen one yet, but what God healed. Then I noticed that little eye moving over like that. Oh, God. I fell down on my face. I said, God, please don't take her. Oh, God, are you going to? I said, take me first. Let me die. I'm the one that's stressed, stress. But God knows just how to get at your heart. <laughs> yes, he does. I said, I'm the one that's done wrong, Lord. Oh, don't take my baby. Take me, Lord. My wife, lady, I'm in the morgue. And here you go, take my baby. Please don't do it, Lord. I, I served you. I, I'm ashamed of myself that I listened to somebody that said to you, I'm I said, I've done all I can to raise just to be a good boy. 
I said, there lays the dust of the earth. Poor mother, she comes from. But honey boy, beyond this veil in Jerusalem, there's an empty grave. They were dead in Christ. Someday they'll come forth from that grave. We little fellow snub and we knelt and prayed at the grave. I remember trying to go to work after that. A little later on, I thought I'd go to a place like home. If you ever had your home broken up, there'll never be no place to take its place. I found no peace nowhere. One day even was ready to commit suicide. When I went into the room, I just couldn't stand it any longer. Just I got up, I was a lineman, I got up on a post, and I was one morning I was singing, on the hill far away stood an old rugged cross. And I happened to look, and that cross arm on the post, and he sang swinging back in my safety. My shadow on that hillside where that post was looked like the cross or something. I thought, yes, it was my sin that hung in there. And I looked on, and I said, oh, God, I can't stand it anymore. I said, Sharon Rose, honey, I'm coming to see you this morning. I took off my glove, was lying in your nose, 2300 bolt glove. I pulled my rubber glove off, here run the primary, running right by me, 2300 bolt, touch it, break every bone in your body. I said, Sharon, honey, do you hear me? Daddy's coming home to see you this morning. I pulled my glove off. I said, God, this is a cowardly trick. You wife, I passed by as I always tried to be a gentleman. I took off my hat and I said, how do you do, young lady? She said, hello, Dad. I said, Dad? Well, I said, I'm as old as you are. How can I be your dad? She said, Dad, you just don't realize where you are. I said, this is heaven. She said, where's my brother, Billy Paul? And I said, what is this? She said, Daddy, down on earth, I was your little Sharon Rose. I said, Sharon, and you're a lady? She said, yes. Little babies don't be here, Dad. She said, we're all of one age. She said, Mother's looking for you. And I said, where's Mother? She said, up at your new home. And I said, new home? I said, oh, why? I haven't got no home, honey. I said, Branham's don't have homes. They're vagabonds. She said, but Dad, you got a home here? She said, turn this way. And I looked, it looked like a hill, a great mansion setting everywhere, the glow of God coming up from around it. She said, Mother's waiting for you up there, Dad. And I, she said, I'm going to wait for Billy Paul. Mother wants to see you. And I started running up like that, the steps. And as I got up, as usual, there she stood. Not sick anymore, beautiful, her dark hair hanging down to her shoulders. Her black, snappy eyes looking at me, dressed in white. She reached out her arms and she said, Bill. I went up real quick, fell down at her feet, took hold of her hand, and I said, Honey, I don't understand it. She said, Stand up, honey. I stood up. She said, Look. I said, I see Sharon. Honey, she's a beautiful girl. She said, Yes, she is. She said, She's waiting for Billy. And I said, oh, I, I can't understand all this. She said, I know you can't, but you'll wake up after a while and you'll understand. I said, Bill, you're wearing yourself to death. I said, don't worry about Sharon and I. We're better off than you are. I said, everything's all right. I said, you just go on and do as you promised. And I said, well, I hope I can't understand all about this. She said, won't you sit down? And I looked, and there was a great big Morris chair. I looked over at her. She said, you remember, don't you? And I said, yes. One time when I preached, I worked all day and preached every night. And I come in and I wanted a place to rest. And I got an old Mars chair, paid $15 for it. And I paid a dollar down and a dollar every other week. And I got five or six dollars paid and I couldn't make the payments. And one day when I come home, she told me that I had a gun there and we just couldn't make the payment. I just had to let it go back. Now, it was the only piece of furniture we had in the house that was worth anything. And we had about one third paid for it. And that evening when I come in, she was a sweetheart. She, she know, she'd bake me a cherry pie. She knew how I liked it. And she'd bake me a cherry pie. And she said she'd have some of the little boys to dig some fishing worms. And we was going down to the river fishing. And she was telling me all and I know there was something wrong. And after supper, she said, now let's go down to the river right away, Bill. And she didn't like fishing, but she knew I did. So she said, let's go to the river. And I said, honey, what's happened today? She said, nothing. And I could see the tears in that big eyes. I know there was something wrong. I said, let's go into the front room. I thought something wrong. And they I already sent them word to come get it. So they took my chair. When I went to the door, 
She looked over and she put her arms around me. She said, Bill, I tried hard, honey. I, I, I tried. It isn't. I said, no, sweetheart, it isn't your fault. But some of these days, things will be different. And, and someday God will make a way and we'll have a, a nice chair. And don't you believe that? And she said, I, I hope we do, Bill. And just then, in this dream, she pointed to a big chair. And then she looked at me. I said, you remember that chair? She said, yes. She said, but honey, they'll never come and get this one. This was already paid for. They'll never come after this. But I know, oh, my Christian friends, somewhere beyond the sky, yonder, when this mortal life of mine shall fade out, and do it tomorrow. I know that there's rest for me beyond the river. I have a chair over there, a home, a place. I love him with all my heart, and it's truly with all my heart and my sad mistakes that I've made back to life. You let them be stepping stones. My time is past. Would you just do this? It's you have never made your peace with God, and you realize that someday maybe your experience wasn't mine. I hope it wasn't. But remember that every mortal in here has got to face God someday yonder. I remember the last kiss I put on her lips. Someday I'll meet her yonder beyond that just as sure as I'm standing here. The grace of God saves me. It keeps me day by day, and I live so here. One woman said to me not long ago, about a year ago or two, she said, Brother Bram, when in the world, when you're home, the sick people pouring in, when you're out here at a meeting, when do you ever have any rest? A few years ago, you look in the book back there, you wouldn't know I was the same man. When I returned home after my first great meeting, even my baby was scared of me and run from me. I lost most of my hair. It come out, my shoulders had shrunk down. Something had happened. What's the matter? It's by the revelation of the vision of God that moves down and I know it's happened in my life daily. I looked the other day when I was standing using my razor, I thought, oh, how can it be that a few years has made such a new boy? But one of these days when I cross over on the other side, things will be different then. I love you. I'm here at this place of Hammond, Indiana, to do my very best to help you. I'm here to pray with you. I'm here to do all I can. As you see me laboring with all my soul to try to get people to believe on Jesus Christ. And at that glorious day when I come up before him there, I'd like to look back and see this whole mass of people standing there and say, Lord Jesus, that's the best that I could do. You hear him say, it was well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. That's where I expect to be someday. One of these days when it grows out, I'll, I'll be done. I'll have to stand before him. Let's bow our heads just a minute. Heavenly Father, as I look back, trying here knowing that i got a service tonight, Realizing that I must hold myself together with all that I've got to minister to the people. As I think back down along that life journey there, all the sorrows and heartaches and hunger and mistakes, God, there may be a young man sitting here today or a young woman just stepping out on the crossroads of life. There may be some man or woman that spent the most of their days and yet never has accepted thee. How thankful I am when I walk over to the grave of my loved one laying there, knowing this, that that is like a corn of wheat that fell into the earth. And in there lays a germ of immortal life, that it too shall come just when the sun comes, when the Son of God shines his righteousness upon the earth. Then will my little chair and rose rise. Then will I embrace her in my arms, said, darling baby. God knows best. You know that I had no way to take care of you. 
You know what was best? Maybe you'd have got out here in some of these old houses or something and been like some of the modern girls. You tuck in over your yard now, sweetheart, with mommy. And someday daddy will come. Oh, God, I pray today as your servant. I pray that if there's that person here that doesn't know you just at this time, that they will say, this is the hour that I'm going to bypass all those troubles. I'm going to accept Christ as my Savior. I'm going to be filled with his spirit, and I'm going to live for you. If there's a young couple here, Lord, that doesn't know you, I pray that this will be the hour of their decision. Grant it, Father. Excuse me for being a baby, Lord, but just the memories of old times. How those sorrowful days of sweat and tears and toils and heartache and death and hunger. God, may your spirit now speak peace to some heart. And while we have our heads bowed, if there's anybody in the building that would like to become a Christian just at this time, would you raise up your hand and say, Brother Branham, I believe that God hears your prayer. I want you to pray for me. I want to now accept Christ. God bless you, you, you. Someone on down here on the lower floors again. Someone else wants to accept Christ as personal Savior. Wants to be remembered in prayer. I believe that God hears my prayer. Would you come forward? Would you just raise your hand first? Up in the balcony to my left. Is there a sinner up there who would like to accept Christ? If you see the miracles of God and see that God answers my prayer, would you accept him now as your Savior? Believe us. I just remember you in a word of prayer. Will you raise your hands? You're sitting up there. You may all be Christians. I don't know. God knows your heart. I love you. To the balcony, to the back. If anyone back there would want to say, Brother Bam, remember me. I am a sinner. Just pray for me that I'll be saved. Would you raise your hand? God bless you, sir. I see your hand. God bless you, sis. I see your hand. Someone over to the balcony, to the right. Would you raise your hand and say, Brother Bam, remember me in a word of prayer? I believe that God will hear your prayer. If you're not a sinner, you are a sinner, rather, wants to accept Christ. God bless you. I see your hand, sister. Someone else, I see you. Yes, and you, young lady, I see you. Down to the bleachers here to my right, would you raise your hand and say, remember me? God bless you, sir. I see your hand. Someone now in the center of the right hand aisle here, raise your hand. As we go through any sinners in here, raise your hand. This aisle in here, would you raise your hand? If there's not, I'll pass over to the left aisle. That's between you and God. Now in the left aisle, raise your hand, you the sinners, and say, Brother Bam, remember me in a word of prayer, if you will. Would you raise your hand in the left aisle here to my left? All right. In the left bleacher, would you raise your hand? God bless you, 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 yes. And then he's sitting along there. God bless you all. Way back in the back, standing out in the room, are you a sinner today and would like to say, Brother Bam, remember me in a word of prayer? I want to become a Christian, and truly, I believe there's a heaven, and I, I've had troubles too in my life, and I want to accept Christ now as my Savior, that in me might become a germ of life, a new birth. Would you raise your hand and say, remember me? All right. All those now who would like to be remembered in prayer for this prayer, would you stand to your feet just now while we pray for you? This is a witness. He that will witness me before man, I'll witness him before my Father and the holy angels. That's right. Look, standing up everywhere, over in the balconies, everywhere that you can, you that wants to be remembered in closing prayer, would you just stand to your feet and say, Brother Branham, I, I now I want, I want to be remembered in this prayer that Jesus Christ will. That's wonderful. Somebody else, someone else, that's right. That's wonderful. Oh, I'm so happy to see you do that. Mother with a little baby. God bless you, sir. I wonder, I wonder. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to shake your hand. I'd just love to shake your hand and pray with you here at the altar. I wonder while the music is singing, or the music is playing, and we're singing, lowly, almost persuaded now to believe. I wonder if you would down there, if you'll slip right up here at the altar, come right down out of the balconies, would you? Right down here, and let, let me stand here and pray with you right here before you. I can lay my hands on you. Will you do that? You here that won't accept Christ now as your Savior. I want to see sisters back there. If you just walk up here, I'll be happy to pray with you. If you'll just come forward, that's fine. God bless you. That's wonderful. Come right down out of the balconies, out of the bleachers. You and come right up here now, and we want Jesus to hear us. Oh, how marvelous. Oh,
Nazareth. We pray now in thy name. Speak now, these eyes said that will come and confess me before man. Then will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. While we all have our head bowed, is there any in the building that would desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit now that you would like to come and be filled with the Holy Spirit? you line right up with me here. would like to receive the Holy Spirit. It might make such a difference. If you hear a sinner, a sick person, if you come accept Christ, it might make such a difference. Now is the hour. Marvelous. Look at those who are hungering for God. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. God be merciful. Just look, friends. Except a man be born of the water and spirit, he cannot see the kingdom. Not upon the strength of my dead wife, no, sir. Upon the strength of God's Bible. I'm saying this, friend. If you have in the Holy Spirit, don't you try to face eternity without being born again. God have mercy on us. Marvelous. That's right, young man. The young lady ought to have come to you. All right, everybody together now while we sing, Have Thy Own Way, Lord. Come on together now. All right, give us a card, sister. Have Thy Own Way. personal workers, ministers of the gospel, gather right around. You're going to see the glory of God fill this place. I feel it right now in my heart. God is moving. He was telling me for a long time, hold up just a moment. There are many, he said, it's coming now, seeking for God that's going to be filled sent away rejoicing, and tonight will be the greatest night that you've seen yet. Let the personal workers gather right in along close now where they can be ready. You have it All right. Now, while they're gathering, let's all bow our heads everywhere. Now, I want the sinners, those who have not yet accepted Christ, that you want to be saved. I want you to look this way to me. That, that's not the one seeking for the Holy Ghost, just the sinner. Jesus Christ died for you. He wants each one of you to be saved. And someday, my friend, I must meet you up yonder to stand in his presence to give an account for what I've told you. God forbid that I be found a misinterpreter of God's Word. Now, Jesus said, He that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. And whosoever heareth my word, that's the Holy Spirit calling, and believeth on him that sent me, that's God, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life. Aren't you happy you come this afternoon, lady? You were the one I was speaking about. Now look, now something spoke to your heart. Here's the boy over here. All right. Now, is that the scripture? 
Now, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe the Bible story is virgin birth? Do you believe that's the truth? And do you now accept him as your Savior, that you are right now renounce all sin in your life, and you accept him as your Savior, and to the best of your knowledge, you will live for him the rest of your days? If you do, raise up your hand, sinner. You now accept him. Now, while you bow your head, I'm going to say something, and what I, what prayer that I say, you pray. This is what it takes to cleanse your life, you see. This prayer that you repeat what I say, only I'm just saying it. You pray it to God, not repeat it behind me, but you pray it to God. Now, while we all have our heads bowed, let the sinners say this.